This is one of these debates where I think that there are the inveterate one boxers, the inveterate evidentialists, and the inveterate causalists. And I doubt that we're going to move each other. I, I don't think that there's a hidden contradiction in evidentialism that you know the people who have really thought about it a lot have failed to notice. But it's just not a way that I find very natural to think at all. The way that I find it most natural to think is in terms of valuing acts that create good outcomes, not valuing acts that give me evidence of good outcomes. Welcome everyone to today's AMA, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor J. Dimitri Gallo. He is currently a senior research fellow at the Dianoia Institute of Philosophy, I hope I pronounced that right, at the Australian Catholic University, and was recently assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy in the University of Pittsburgh. His work focuses primarily on decision theory, metaphysics, epistemology, and a bit in the philosophy of science as well. Uh, he has a variety of, of published articles in these fields. Uh, if there's something you'd like to add, feel free. But with that, welcome J. Dimitri Gallo. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Yeah. Um, I think mo most, so most of the uh, questions that I'm going to have are going to be related to uh, decision theory, because it's actually something that I'm uh, quite interested in myself. But sort of as a introduction to that, or it's going to be something that's relevant to some of those questions that we'll have later. I wanted to talk about causation and something you've, you've published on, you have at least two different articles covering um, causation. One, one uh, arguing for a sort of emergentism, which I found interesting back in 2015. And so, I wanted to, so recently we had David Papineau on as a guest, and I, I was wondering if mm. you are familiar with his paper from 2013 called uh, Causation is Macroscopic but Not Irreducible. And I take this, what he defends there to be a sort of emergentism in that he thinks that there are causal relations that obtain between macroscopic events or, or high level events, mm. to use your terminology, um, and that these are, reducible to microscopic phenomena or low level events, but not reducible to causal relations between low level events, because there are none on his view. Um, I see. Um, so causation is essentially macroscopic in a way. This, this, it's between macroscopic events, but not microscopic ones. Do, do you think yeah. there's any plausibility to this sort of view or, or <clears throat> what do you think about that? Uh, oh, I mean, I think it's certainly plausible. It's not It's not the view that I hold and defend. Uh, I'll say something, I can say something about why it's not the view that I, um, I defend. I mean, I think that there's a, an idea that causal relations don't obtain at the level, at, you know, at the level of fundamental physics that uh, traces back at least to Russell. And I think the... Right. The idea that Russell had in this in this paper on the notion of cause was that look if there are, if there are any causal relations at the level of fundamental physics then it looks like everything is causing everything else because what fundamental physics gives us is just these differential equations that say how the entire state you know I mean in Newtonian mechanics the entire state of the universe at a time is going to generate the entire state of a universe at a later time, and uh, and I think that some people think, well, causation looks at least in, in our sort of usual macroscopic day-to-day -day interactions with it like it's kind of local relation that's relatively discriminating. And when you look at fundamental physics, you don't find those kind of local discriminating um, causal relations. It looks like just everything about the world is to some extent responsible for everything else. That happens in the world at a, at a future time, at least in Newtonian mechanics. And so I think it's a natural reaction to have to say that there is no causation at the fundamental physical level. Um, that's not my own reaction. I think that there's just so goddamned much of it <laughs> that it's not worth talking about, really. I think that it's, it's true that sort of everything depends upon everything else at a fundamental physical level. And I think the reason that I'm attracted to that kind of view is that um, 
uh, is that, well, I mean, putting, putting aside some caveats, I think that counterfactual dependence is sufficient for causation. I, I actually don't think that, but, you know, the, the reasons I don't think it, I think, aren't relevant to this discussion. But I think that roughly sort of counterfactual dependence between the right kinds of events is always going to be sufficient for a causal relation existing between those events. And I think that when you look at fundamental physical events where I mean, but by a fundamental physical event, I mean an event that is individuated very finely in terms of the precise arran arrangement of fundamental physical entities and the precise sort of fundamental physical properties that they have. So the, the things that I'm calling fundamental physical events are incredibly fragile. If you make any you know, if you make any changes to the charges of any particles, if you make any difference to the locations of the velocities of the momenta of any particles, that makes a difference with respect to the fine-grained fundamental physical event. Uh, I think when you look at those kinds of events, they basically all are causally related. Anything in the past light cone of an event uh, counts as a cause of that event because the event will counterfactually depend upon it. You make minor changes to the past state of the world, and it'll make changes to the future state of the world, given the kinds of laws um, that we think that we think actually exist uh, at the actual world. So I think for that reason, I think causation isn't particularly interesting at the fundamental physical level. It's far more interesting to theorize in terms of differential equations. But I nevertheless think there are quite a lot of causal relations uh, at the fundamental physical level. Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, approach. So the, the the sort of argument that uh, Papineau uses in that paper, maybe elsewhere, is that, like on his view, causation is something which is supposed to be symmetric in time, and perhaps even strictly, uh, sorry, asymmetric in time, that is, yeah, causes good. generally, and perhaps strictly perceive their effects um, mm. in time. And if that's the case, he, the um, and there's microscopic causal relations uh, or microphysical causal relations, then there should be the laws governing or describing the way the microscopic things evolve that are also asymmetric in time. For if they are asymmetric in time, um, he charges that those symmetric um, uh, those symmetric laws can't ground or however he puts it, the asymmetry yeah. uh, causal relations. And I you see. don't I get see. the asymmetry or the relevant asymmetries in the microphysics, but you do in the macrophysics of like statistical mechanics and, I see. and so on. What, 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 I do see. Think, what do you think of this sort of approach? Um, yeah, sorry. So I mean, I, ha I thought a bit about this stuff about the time asymmetry. And I think that, you know, if I mean, I think that the you know if the laws are time reversal invariant, um, and there's some controversy about whether they are. But you know, suppose the the laws are are time reversal invariant, and just think about like a simple Newtonian world where you've got two particles. You know, the only the only thing that ever exists throughout the entire history of the universe are these two particles that are on a trajectory for each other, uh, and then they bounce off of each other at a certain point of time, and they're you know. Uh, they, they they then travel away from each other for all all of the rest of history. That's like a perfectly symmetrical Newtonian world. And I think in a world like that, you're not going to unless there's a kind of primitive directionality uh, to time itself, it's going to be difficult to give any theory that says that um, causation is is pointing in one direction or the other there. Um, so I guess I I do agree with that. But you you know it's not. It's not obvious to me that just because in those kinds of perfectly symmetrical, um, in those kinds of perfectly symmetrical worlds where there's not a primitive directionality, um, there's not a kind of primitive arrow of time. Uh, just because in those worlds you can't define a direction of causation asymmetrically, it doesn't follow that in our world at the fundamental physical level you can't define um, uh, a, a direction of causation. I mean, you could you could just take the kind of macroscopic properties of our world and use them to sort of fix a direction of causation. Um, you say that like the direction of entropy increases the direction 
of, uh, of causation. And that holds even at a fundamental physical level. I mean, I'm not endorsing that view, but it seems to me that it's not. The time symmetry of the equations, I don't think forces you to say anything about whether or not there's causal relations at the microphysical level. You might also think that, I mean, I think that it's not, I should say, I don't think it's, um, I, I don't think that uh, it, it's necessary or a conceptual truth that causation is a, an anti-symmetric relation. So in other words, I think that causal loops are possible uh, in time travel scenarios, for instance. And so I might not be terribly bothered to say that at a fundamental physical level, you know, the, the future events can cause past events. Yeah, I think, I think, I'm not exactly sure what he would say, I, I, but I think he's open to the possibility, like David Papineau is open to the possibility of, um, causal loops or backward causation, but his argument relies mm. on the, at least a general asymmetry, you know, causes usually precede their effects. Um, yeah. In time. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess you're, I mean, you're skeptical. It definitely skeptical. seems plausible. Yeah. So I guess one thing you're skeptical of here is the, the inference from, okay, this, these sort of dynamical laws, if they are, uh, temporally sy uh, symmetric, um, that doesn't necessarily undermine uh, there being even generally asymmetric causal relations of the things described by those. Yeah, I mean, I don't have, I should say, I'm not sort of firmly planting my flag anywhere in this terrain. I'm just sort of, I'm trying to sort of say where, how it seems to me, what it seems to me the menu of options are. And it seems to me like it's, it's, an, it's available to say that at a fundamental physical level causes precede their effects but that that the reason for that has to do with contingent macroscopic asymmetries having to do with in the universe starting off in a low entropy condition. That's a kind of position you could hold. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. That's definitely worth that's definitely a position and worth exploring. Um, I had another question uh, relating to that paper. So um, you talk about causal reductionism and, and the way you frame that um, is that uh, on causal reductionism, high level uh, causal relations are uh, entail some low level co uh, causal relations between their realizers. Um, and I was wondering if this, this sort of defense is available uh, in favor of that uh, view. Of course, you uh, argue against causal reductionism of this sort. And the defense would go something like this. So. Uh, causal relations obtained between events, um, not descriptions of events, and an event described in a sort of coarse-grained way is just the same event as that event described in a fine-grained way. What we have mm. here is just two different sorts of descriptions of the same event, and causal reductionism follows if both of those events, well, it's just that event is one event, or if both of the events <laughs> causally related um, have high and, and, and low level descriptions. Um, do you understand what I'm saying here? Uh, I so do. Like, yeah, this is, this is the position that I take it. Donald Davidson defended. Where yeah, he thought, like you know, he thought there's no, there's no difference between, you know, it, it, it suppose there's, suppose I arrived late, then there's no difference. He says between my arrival and my late arrival, those are just one in the same events. And so, you know, if if my late arrival caused something, then my arrival had to cause it as well. Oh, sort of in any way of just you know any two descriptions he thinks that correspond to the same region of space time are going to be the same event, on his view. You're still picking out the same region of space time. It's just yeah. you're describing it differently or including more detail or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, I should say that I I disagree with that picture of events. So I, I, I think that the causal relata are more fine grained than Davidson takes them to be. And, uh, and, but I mean, it, suppose that, suppose that I went along with that kind of picture of events so that what an event is, is just a region of space time. Uh, then, I mean, I think that it would, just terminologically, it, that wouldn't be the kind of view that I called 
uh, causal reductionism. I think it would be the kind of view I called causal eliminativism. But the you know the only the only kinds of causal relations that there are on that picture are causal relations between um, fine grained fundamental physical events. Because you know in any way of describing what goes on in a region of space time. Uh, is exactly the same event. And so I can describe what goes on in the region of space time in a maximally fine grained way. So I can describe it according, you know, by giving a fundamental physical description of what's going on. And that'll pick out the same region of space time as if I were to describe uh, that region of space time by saying, you know, Dimitri arrived or Dimitri said hello or something like that. So this is a picture on which all of the causal relations there are are causal relations between low level events. Um, so I think the the thing I would want to say about that view is just that it seems to me to fly in the face of some of the what I take to be the data about causation. So you know I think that uh, uh, I think that. You know, as I was saying earlier, I think that basically all low level fundamental physical events are causally related. I think at a high level of description, it can sound just manifestly false to say that these high level events are causally related. I mean, I think that whatever the low level realizer of China's one child policy is, it's causally related to whatever the low level fundamental physical realizer of Zimbabwe's hyperinflation is. But China's one child policy was not a cause of Zimbabwe's hyperinflation. So I think that, you know, I think it's just going to end up saying a bunch of false things or things that strike me as false. Um, I mean, th I, there are other examples of this. Uh, so there's an example from Michael Strevin's book, Depth, where he talks about uh, the death of Rasputin. And the idea was that uh, well, what, what actually kills Rasputin, supposedly, was throwing him into the river. He died of drowning. But all of the poison that was given to Rasputin sort of earlier in the day did make a difference with respect to the manner of his death. And so you know, the way that he died was changed by the, the sort of poison that was, he was given. I don't know if everyone knows the story of Rasputin's death, but they kept trying to kill him. They gave him a bunch of poison and that didn't kill him. Uh, and then they shot him and then that didn't kill him. And then eventually they threw him into the river. And apparently that was the thing that uh, that eventually led to him dying was he died of drowning. Um, but of course, you know, you can there are counter there's counterfactual variation between giving him poison and the particular death that he died. You know, if he hadn't been given poison, and the particular death that he would have died would have been vastly different at a fundamental physical level. And if you think that, so in other words, I think that that fundamental physical event of his death would not have occurred without the poison. So if you think that his death, that coarse grained description, his death just is the same thing as the fine grained fundamental physical event. then I think that you should say that giving the poison uh, caused his death. But that seems that seems wrong to me. It seems like poison wasn't the thing that caused him. The thing that, that wasn't the thing that killed him. The thing that killed him was the drowning. Yeah. So, I want, so at the beginning of your response here, um, you you said how this view would seem to lead to some sort of eliminativism, and it wasn't quite clear mm. to me. I, I mean, because it takes. It seems to me that someone who takes this sort of view would be saying that, um, yes, the, the of course the situation, sort of the event as a region of space time could be wholly described in terms of um, like microphysical um, uh, states of affairs, whatever, um, those sorts of descriptions. But that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, the statement about the causal relation between um, that uh, events described in high level ways are false. Um, in other words, why would these sort of low level descriptions take precedence over the high level ones? You kind of understand. I think, I think, yeah. 
Yeah, I get, I get what's going on. I think that what's happening is just that I'm using, I had some stipulative terminology in the paper and the stipulative terminology was that an event which is picked out by a fundamental physical description is a low level event. And then I called an event high level just in case it was distinct from every low level event. So if you say uh, that okay. events picked out, you know, that any region of space time whatsoever picked out by a low level description, uh, sorry, if you say that every event can be picked out by a low level fundamental physical description, because we can always just describe what's going on in that region of space time in the terms of fundamental physics, then it will turn out that every event is a low level event. And so all of the causal relations that there are will be causal relations between low level events. And so it, that that was a, a kind of view that I called causal eliminativism. But we, you know, we could define the terms differently and and yeah. it would be it would come out as a different kind of view. But that's just that that was the way that I was carving up logical space. Right. I, I see. So for there to be high level events, then are we require uh, high level? Sorry. Uh, for there to be high-level events in the first place, does that require that there are some which are not um, identical with, like low-level events? Yeah. Well, yeah. As I'm as I'm using the term in that paper, what I, what I'm calling a high-level event, just is something that's not um, a fundamental physical event. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I guess I have to think about that some more. I did have another sort of question about causation more generally or about causal concepts. Mm. And when I think about our like, causal concepts, as, as I do about a number of our concepts, I, I think we start with sort of particular judgments of singular causation. Um, we make observations, we, you know, talk about our the behaviors that we have and the sort of changes we think that those produce in the world and we judge those to be causal and we we sort of add to the extension of our concept by making further judgments of this sort and then mm. in this at the same time we also um develop sort of general commitments regarding criteria for causal relationships um yeah do you think this is sort of capturing What's happens and what's happening when we sort of have develop our, our concept of causation? And we sort of start with particular judgments, kind of abstract away from those and make general commitments um, about the criteria and, and so forth. Does that make sort of sense to you? I think so. I mean, maybe there's a kind of there's a psychological question, I think, about where the concept of causation comes from and you know, how it develops. Uh, and there's a, a psychological question about how hardwired a concept is. And I think that there's actually been a lot of empirical research on this, but it's not research that I've looked into very much. I can tell you my, my gut feeling is that our causal judgments are relatively universal, relatively widely shared, and relatively innate. But, you know, I can't back that up with uh, scientific results, but that's how it, that's how it seems to me. Fair enough. Yeah. So, so the second thing I had sort of when thinking about this, uh, sort of thought I had when thinking about this is that um, when we try to provide a, like a precise account of causation um, or make statements about it that are underdetermined by our the vague concept and or the particular causable judgments we make um, on which it's based um we can make things that aren't or are either just false or just not demonstrably true um so like on, on this view what philosophers are, are largely doing now is developing different um more precise concepts that they call causation. You know, we have interventionist theories, kind of factual theories, probabilistic theories, whatever. Mm. Um, many, many of these are consistent with some more 
basic common notion that most people share. But none of these are necessarily the right account of it because there's just no fact of the matter about which is the right account of it. They're just different notions, different concepts. Does this sort of approach make sense to you here? What do you think of that? Well, it definitely makes sense. I think it's, it's not the way that I'm inclined to think about things. I think the way that I'm inclined to think about things, there is a relation that we are thinking and talking about when we think and talk about causation. And the theories that we give can you know, say true or false things about that relation. Uh, I, I think that sociologically what you say is true of quite a lot of philosophers working on causation. So I think that, for instance, people like Phil Dow are pretty explicitly not trying to capture our ordinary causal judgments. They're trying to, I'm sorry, sorry, Phil Dow is trying to give a, uh, an alternative concept. He's trying to give something like a Carnapian explication of the concept of causation. Uh, I, I guess I think that, I think that I guess I'm interested in giving a theory of causation in part because I think that it has important roles to play in the way that we think about the world more generally. I think that it has an important role to play in the way that we assign moral responsibility for actions. I think it has an important role to play in you know, theories of how we explain in ordinary life and in science. And so it's important to me that I'm giving a theory of, you know, the actual relation that we're thinking and talking about when we think and talk about causation. And I think that there is a fact of the matter about what that thing is. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, it, I guess it's a general concern I have that, like, why I think that there is some relation, unique relation out there that you know, everyone's getting at when they're talking about causation, or at least that that would be the describing that relation would be to give the right account of causation. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm like somewhat skeptical that that's really what's going on. Um, we just, our, our concepts are not um, precise enough to, to think that we're talking about a specific relation like that. Oh, they're definite, our concepts are definitely not precise. I think it's definitely, there's definitely vagueness in the concept of causation, but you know, I think nevertheless, there is uh, a concept that we're talking, so there is a relation that we've picked out with our sort of ordinary thought and, and talk. I mean, it's just in the same way that in the Sorites, right. you can accept that there is a sharp cutoff point, even while accepting, you know, there, there is a point in a Sorites sequence that goes from red to yellow. There is a sort of last shade, which is red. Um, I, I think that's true. I think that follows from uh, sort of some relatively uncontroversial uh, logical assumptions. Um, I think similarly, there is some relation that we're talking about when we think and talk about causation. It's not determinate what that relation is. It's going to be vague what that relation is, but nevertheless, there is something that we're thinking and talking about. Yeah, that, Just like that, there is a last, yeah. Well, that much is fine. Uh, but I, is it, because I think philosophers want to say that the, the concept is precise enough such that, you know, these different theories, as I mentioned, you know, whether we're talking about interventionist, probabilistic, whatever, that, that there's a fact of the matter about which of those is right. Um, as a right account of, of that relation. Um, but I'm, I'm somewhat, somewhat concerned that it really isn't that precise. There is, yeah, there is no fact I, of the matter about which else is right. I mean, I'm reasonably confident that a great many of those theories are just um, determinately false. If I yeah. had a theory that was not determinately false, I would be very happy. Uh, but I do think, <laughs> I think that like, uh, you know, probabilistic theories face all kinds of problems. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I yeah, I mean, in, words interventionism may, know, may well be true. Um, I think a sort of simple Lewisian theory is determinately false. I think it determinately conflicts 
with some pretty central causal judgments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely agree that there's <laughs> serious problems with Lewis's approach. But um, fair enough. Yeah, I, I wanted to move on to a bunch of questions I had, more specifically about decision theory. Um, and awesome. One thing you've talked about uh, with respect to causal decision theory is that a key normative commitment of of these sorts of theories, um, usually at least, is that counterfactuals concerning like what would happen given different actions are central mm. to determining rational choice. And yeah. I feel that eviden evidentialists can share this commitment, um, yet they're inclined to disagree either on uh, how to assess the these counterfactuals or um, which counterfactuals exactly they think are relevant to rational de deliberation. Um, in, in particular, when assessing the counterfactuals, causalists want to hold fix uh, state of, states of the world which are causally independent from, or at least which are not the causal consequences of, um, the, right. the choice. And you talk about the, you talk, I think in, in the decision and foreknowledge, you label this the causal independence principle. Or something like that. Um, but uh, why why make this sort of commitment? Instead, why not say just hold fixed the commitments of the subject facing the decision problem, which you know may just be the details of the problem itself. I see. Uh, good. So sorry. There's sorry. There was I, I, I kind of went on for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah. I mean. I think that the, what I take to be the core commitment of causal decision theory is that um, the instrumental, the objective instrumental value of an action is given by what that action would bring about. And that's a kind of counterfactual notion. Now, I agree that you could, as an evidentialist, you could sort of understand the counterfactuals in such a way that they hold fixed your evidence and you allow to swing free other things. So, you know, in, in Newcomb's problem, you would have a kind of backtracking counterfactual that would hold fixed the reliability of the prediction. And you could say things like, if I were to take both of these boxes, then there wouldn't be money in the opaque one. And if I were to take just the opaque one, there would be a million dollars in it. Uh, I agree with that. I think that that's not an objective measure of instrumental value um, because it depends crucially upon you know, what your evidence is. It, it depends upon what your epistemic state is like. So I think, I, I mean, I agree with you that you could give different readings of the counterfactuals in such a way that you say that the, there's something like the instrumental value of an action is given by what the performance of that action would bring about. I think that it would not be an objective um, notion of instrumental value because the instrumental value is going to shift depending upon what evidence you have, what your credences are. Yeah. So um, maybe we could get more clear on what we mean, what you mean by objective instrumental value, because I worry that. Look, there's a difference between um, objective decision theory and like subjective decision theory. And on the latter, our, our um, sort of decision making process, what, what matters for, ra for rational decision making on the subjective decision theory is only the sort of subjective credences of subjects and their preferences that they have. Um, we don't need to add in sort of objective probabilities or objective values or anything like that to make, to assess the rational choice. It's only the subjective states of the individual. And um, is that consistent with this objective instrumental value? Um, like is objective instrumental value a notion of like, that's um, implying some sort of objective decision theory or is that consistent with 
subjective decision theory, or, or does that make any sense? Uh, could you say a little bit more about what the distinction is supposed to be between the objective and the subjective decision theory? Yeah, so we have some formula for assessing like expected utility, and mm. a we have that we can have that at least in principle on both objective and subjective theory. However, the inputs vary. On an objective theory, what we input into the formula will be sort of like objective chances, like uh, like probabilities of certain events completely independent potentially from what a subject believes. They're just objective features about the world. And maybe like objective values of things, right? Again, and where these objective values may differ radically from the sort of preferences that a subject has. Mm. So those are the inputs on the objective one, objective decision theory. Mm. But the inputs on the subjective one are going to be those subjective credences and the subjective values. And right, the output is right. based only on those. Yeah. So definitely, I think that, you know, as I understand causal decision theory, it's a subjectivist theory in that sense. It's your, you know, even the formulations right. of causal decision theory, which are going to appeal to objective chance, are going to be talking about your credences. The objective chance is thus and so, and not the actual right. objective chances. And so I definitely think it's a subjective decision theory. It's when you, when you talk about what's rational, you have to ask about what your credences are and what your utilities are, sorry, what your, what your desires are. Uh, but as I see it, the, the causalist's position is that what you are trying to do, you know, from your, you know, from the perspective that you occupy, you are attempting to choose the action that has the most objective instrumental value. Um, and so it's, it's subjective because you don't know which action has the highest objective instrumental value. But you're trying to pick the one that you expect to have highest um, objective instrumental value. Or at least, I mean, sorry, that's, I mean, that is to say, you're trying to pick the one which has the greatest expected objective instrumental right. value, where the objective instrumental value, again, is what, what would come about, the desirability of what would come about were you to select the act. Yeah, and then, but the would there again, is assessed holding fixed causally That's right. independent features. Um, That's right. So what, what, I guess my question is, what, what is the motivation for assessing the, the counterfactual in that way, rather than, say, the way the evidentialist might, as you suggested? Oh, I mean, let's see. So what's the, I mean, I take it that the, the motivation is that evaluating the counterfactual in that way um, so I call I call these counterfactuals causal counterfactuals because they're counterfactuals that hold fixed the things that you cannot causally influence and allow to swing free the things that you can causally influence. The reason for focusing on causal counterfactuals as opposed to backtracking counterfactuals is that the things that you don't have any causal influence over are not things that you're in a position to affect. And so they're not, it's not relevant to evaluating the objective instrumental value of the action that, you know, uh, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm looking at the objective instrumental value of the action, what I'm interested in is what it would bring about, that is to say, what it would causally bring about, what's causally downstream of my choice. And I'm not interested in stuff that's causally upstream of the choice. I mean, right. I should... I should say right now I'm giving a an exposition of orthodox causal decision theory. It's not the decision theory that I myself endorse, but um, yeah, that's fine. I just um, I worry that when when we're assessing these kind of factuals, okay, um, uh, when we say okay, had I made say I make this choice A, and we talk about had I made choice B. Um, what we're assessing the world, like we're trying to look at, you know, like the sort of set of possible worlds in which everything, like causally upstream from my choice is the same, except I choose something different. Um, 
uh, I mean, on some views of, of causation or determinism or whatever, that's just going to be incoherent because you can't have everything upstream being the same and the cause, the choice being different. Do, do you, does that worry uh, make any sense to you? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it, it does make sense. I think that, um, I mean, I think you can, of course, this is not my view, but the, the Lewisian view is that you can have all the past stuff fixed and have your choice be different. It just involves a violation of the laws of nature. And so for Lewis, the right. thing that you should be thinking about are possibilities in which there's a violation of the laws of nature. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's not this, this, that, that's not the kind of way I want to go on those questions. But. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly, I think, some serious problems with his account. I mean, he, he tries to, he allows some backtracking, right? But he wants to, you want to minimize that. Um, yeah. Some, some sort of balancing I mean, act between the, the violations of the, the laws and the, how, how big of a miracle it is, so to speak, and, and, and how far back you have to backtrack and some other yeah. considerations, I forget. I mean, I think one way, just to, to go back to your question about what's the motivation for holding these things fixed, I think that it helps to think about the actions from a kind of third personal point of view. And so if you imagine that you're watching somebody else under, you know, make, make the choice in Newcomb's problem, and you look into their boxes and you see that they have a million dollars in the opaque box and they have a thousand in the transparent box. And you watch them sort of just take the, the one opaque box. I think that from your perspective, it looks like, you know, well, what you could, you could ask yourself, well, what did that choice get them? What was the, you know, what did that choice do to accomplish the ends that they had set for themselves. They've set themselves the end of getting as much money as possible. What did taking just the one box do to promote that? I think that you can say, well, it, it got them $1,000. What would have, what would they have gotten if they had taken both? I think that it seems to me very intuitive and natural to say in that case, that if they'd taken, if they were to have taken both, they would have gotten a million, a thousand. And, uh, I mean, sorry, I, yeah, sorry, I can see, I can see how you're going to respond to this, but yeah, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, from, from a, a related to this, but yeah, yeah, um, so, uh, I, I mean, uh, so the, you talk about this, you know, this third person perspective thing, and I think it's lesson three or maybe it's two, somewhere in that, in that same paper, uh -huh. um, and it reminds me when talking about this better informed perspective, there's an example of the, for Newcomb's problem, the well-wishing friend, I think originally from George Schlesinger, although I didn't, didn't look it up beforehand. Um, you know, we can reason that uh, since the friend would recommend to you taking both boxes regardless of their contents, um, and you can mm -hmm. reason about this even while, take, while facing the problem, um, you should follow what they say. They have more information than you. Um, they're going to make that recommendation regardless. That seems to be the rational thing to, for you to do. Um, but yeah. there's, there's a, a, I guess, a few issues that I would have with this. One that I think you're sort of anticipating, but another that, that came out and uh, was pointed out by William Lane Craig, actually, in his uh, an article from the 80s, 80, 87 or something like that, called foreknowledge on Newcomb's problem. And his response is to say, no, I'm, you know, the, the friend, so long as they're rational and they understand this situation, are, upon seeing the contents of the box, are just going to recognize, oh, this, I mean, they'll see, if there's nothing in the opaque box, they'll be disappointed, I think, to, to know that the person will take both, both boxes, at least in the near perfect case, uh, are, are very likely to take both boxes. And in, in the perfect case, they're certain to. Or if there's a million dollars in the opaque box, then they're delighted to know that the subject will take only one box, or is more likely going to take only one box. Um, they're not going to think, ah, they should take 
both boxes if they if they know they're only going to take one. But, well, they're just going to recognize what they're going to take. Yeah, and why, why would they make any I, recommendation? I, I I have a hard time getting into that mindset. I mean, can, here's an example that I've I've used when talking about this. Imagine that you know you're not there's somebody else who's choosing for you, and suppose you're sort of looking into the boxes, um, and you get and I mean I think that maybe you're thinking about a version where there's you think that it's impossible for the person to take both boxes when it was predicted that they would take only one or something like that. Just suppose that like there's the, the predictor is about 70% reliable um, and you're looking into the boxes uh, and you see, I mean, it doesn't matter what you see, but suppose you see that the opaque box is empty and you get to tell this person what to do. What would you what would you tell them to do if the thing that you wanted, if they're choosing for your benefit, you know, you're going to get the money that yeah. they choose and you can look in and see that the opaque box is empty. In that case, would you tell them to take the opaque box? Yes. And uh, yeah, I would. Uh, sorry, not only the opaque box. I, I would tell them to take both boxes. Um, you, okay. And, yeah. And yeah. here's, and here's, here's why. Um, in the imperfect predictor case, and it becomes more relevant the less perfect the predictor is. Right? The 70 case, I'm more likely to say something than the 99.999% case. Um, because I think that my intervening in this way might make a difference to uh, the sort of choice the person makes. Um, it might make them slightly more likely to make the prediction false if they were predicted to choose one box. And it might make them <laughs> slightly more likely to be uh, make the prediction true if they were predicted to choose both. And um, from my perspective, those that both of those changes are, um, are good. Um, and so I would I would recommend to them taking both. Yeah. Um, I worry, though, the sort of relevance of this to the choice that the subject is making. I mean, after all, my what I'm coming to there is, I mean, we can think of um, uh, that the sort of reasoning process that I just went through as, as a sort of decision problem. I, I mean, should I, I'm deciding what to say to them, if, if anything. Um, and I find some instrumental value in saying something regardless the contents of the box. Um, but that's a different decision problem than the, what the subject is facing. And I, I just, it's not obvious to yeah. me that the, the result of my decision problem, uh, the sort of rational choice for me is uh, determines this rational choice for the subject in Newcomb's problem. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to sort of push you out of being uh, an evidentialist. I mean, I, I think that the evidentialist um, has a, a consistent position, but I was, I was responding to the idea that the um, this William Lane Craig idea that you should not right. advise the person to take both boxes. And it seems, I mean, at least let me say this, if you're an evidentialist, uh, you will advise the person to take both boxes because once the evidentialist knows which is what's in the boxes, they're going to want you to take both of them, no matter what they learn. Right. Um, no, I, so, I, yeah. I mean, I agree. And, but the, the extent to which I would be motivated to say something to them uh, varies with uh, how reliable I think the prediction is. In the limiting case, if I think the prediction is perfect, I, I'm not going to find any instrumental value in making a recommendation to the person because I already know what they're going to do with, like, with certainty. So I know that at this point, my recommendation won't make any difference. Um, in the 99.9% yeah, case, that's right. I mean, I'm probably still going to have more or less the same thought. You know, in the 70% case or the 50.05% case or whatever, um, uh, that may, you know, it becomes more instrumentally valuable to, to, to intervene. Right. Although, I mean, think about the, um, think about not just the question of, whether or not you should give a recommendation. But you know, from this third person perspective, when you're looking in and you see that you know, the opaque box is empty or that the opaque box is full, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you look in and see what's inside the boxes and you see the person sort of reach for just the one, 
do you think to yourself from that? Well, sorry. I mean, instead of instead of thinking about what you advise, think about what you would sort of want most want them to do. From that third person perspective, I think that you would most want them to take both, no matter what they saw. You might know that they're not going to take both. Surely, what you would most desire is for them to take both. Yeah, I think intuitively, I feel like there's something irrational about that. I mean, I, I could. It's, I mean, it's the, the, the V value of them taking both is going to be higher than the V value of them taking just, just the one, at least. Well, so the value of them having, um, you know, the contents of one and the contents of both, of course, uh, given fixing, holding fixed the, the contents of the boxes is going to be higher if they take both. Um, but that, see, I already know, um, yeah, certainly in the perfect predictor case, but more or less reliably in the near perfect case, that um, those aren't the options that I'm comparing. Uh, most likely, the, the, what we're comparing are is them taking, um, in the case where I know that the contents, that they're just going to take, or very likely to take, one, if it's if the million is there. Um, and if I want them to take both, uh, it's more likely that um, it would have been the case that they were predicted to do so, and uh, they would only receive a thousand. So it's like, do I want them to take both given the contents of the box? Um, it seems almost irrational to me. I, I'm, just like, I'm, like, I'm wanting them to do something that I know, or I'm at the very least I'm highly confident they won't do. Yeah, but isn't that what's so weird about that? I mean, I really want, you know, I really want my best friend to cook mapo tofu tonight. I know she won't, but what's there's nothing irrational about wanting her to to cook it, is there? I mean, knowing that somebody's not going to do something doesn't seem like it gives me a reason to not want them to do it. I guess so. I just it it does feel still feels a little bit strange to me. Maybe I, maybe you have to think about it a little bit more clearly though. Um, I don't know. Did, did you have anything more to say about that? Or I, I, I wanted to, I had a sort of related question. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Let's go into the related question. Um, yeah, um, let me see here. Um, actually, it's just another thing about the um, the friend or the sort of objective perspective. Um, mm. I think we have to be careful about how we set this up because we don't, as sort of as I was discussing earlier, we don't want this to violate um, the sort of the commitments of subjective decision theory. Um, so we don't want the, like suppose, I was thinking about this as a sort of example, but you know, you can generate as many as you want. Uh, suppose there's a subject who has the sort of belief and credence profile that are definitive of a Newcomb problem, but unbeknownst to them, if they take both boxes, uh, they'll get killed or something like that. Um, well, the, the yeah. sort of objective uh, perspective, the, the friend who's watching and knows these facts will recommend against taking both boxes. I mean, but that that can't make a difference to ra what's rational for them to do given their that's right. And preferences. That's right. right. So I think what's important about the argument is that these are there are there are two possibilities that, from my point of view, uh, might be actual. So there are two possibilities that I subjectively recognize, and from both of those perspectives, um, I think it's I think there's more objective instrumental value in taking both boxes than taking one. Right, so it, it's not it's not just that you know this is the objective fact of the matter. What's important is that I can recognize from my own subjective point of view, I can recognize that no matter what things are like, there's going to be more objective instrumental value in taking both boxes than in taking just the one. Right, that that makes sense. And and the other thing was um, sort of in favor of uh, holding fixed the parameters of the problem over the um, 
only the sort of causal consequences of the action when assessing the counterfactuals uh, is that otherwise we're going to allow to vary some of the um, sort of commitments definitive of the problem, say, including the reliability of the predictor. Um, so we're going to assess, we might be assessing worlds uh, when reasoning counterfactually about how what would have occurred had we chosen otherwise, in which the predictor is unreliable. Um, but I mean, well, it'll be a world where the predictor gets it wrong. Right. In any case. Um, yeah, but like, but we can easily like, suppose we also know that, um, well, one, we could still, that's still enough to generate a problem if we think the predictor is perfect, and the predictor never gets it wrong. I, I, how are uh -huh. we assessing the counterfactual in that case? And second, yeah. it would still be, a, I mean, it still could be a problem if we reason counterfactually about like, suppose um, everyone who has faced this sort of problem had chosen differently. Well, now we're considering a world in which you know, everyone had chosen differently. Um, and then the predictor is quite unreliable in that case, because I mean, we can suppose that these mm -hmm. are all the predictions it makes. Yeah. So I mean, how do we, I mean, yeah, how do we make sense of these cases? I mean, I guess, I guess maybe I'm not maybe I'm not feeling the force of the question. I guess it seems to me like the way that we ordinarily think about the, the way that we ordinarily think about actions involves us thinking about non-actual possibilities. It involves us thinking about what would have happened if we hadn't done thus and so. So uh, it doesn't strike me as strange when I'm thinking about what an act accomplished, but I think about what I would have gotten if I hadn't done that action. So I, I'm going to end up thinking about a non-actual possibility that may be a possibility in which things that I know to be true are false. But, you know, um, this is how we ordinarily evaluate actions. When I think about sort of whether it was, whether it was rational for me to put my money in a certain stock, I, I ask, well, how much money would I have had if I'd put it in this other stock instead? And I'm thinking about a possibility in which something I know to be true is in fact false. I think it's a completely standard part of our thinking about rational action. Um, an instrumental rationality that we think about non-actual possibilities. No, 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 of course. I mean, obviously, when we're assessing counterfactual, the set of counterfactual conditionals, they're counterfactual, right? So there's things that are are true in the actual world, which are, are false in this sort of counterfactual scenario, um, and vice versa. Uh, but the con I guess the intuition in favor of evidentialism here is that we should be looking at worlds in which the details of the problem are held fixed, right? The, the, it's still, um, we're, we'd still be making a choice between two boxes. There's still a prediction made reliably about what we um, will choose and, and so forth. The things that are allowed to vary, um, you know, the thing that we change the truth value of, say, when reasoning counterfactually is the choice we make and what varies with that, um, but varies with that probabilistically or evidentially, I guess, not necessarily just causally. I mean, that, that's a sort of evidentialist intuition, at least. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think that it should be the kind of thing where where when we're thinking about what to do, we're thinking about. Um, thinking about what would happen if we would choose each of the alternatives. And so that'll involve thinking about situations where you act differently. And when you talk about it, it it'll also involve thinking about things that follow from you acting differently. So in particular, whether or not the predictor guessed it correctly in this case will vary depending upon which action I choose. So I guess, um, Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess I, I'm not, I don't, I mean, I don't feel the force of that uh, intuition, but. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I guess at some point there's going to be maybe a bit of an impasse in that, look, I, when I reason about these things, 
Um, I think, well, I mean, had I chosen differently, I probably would have predicted, been predicted to have chosen differently. And then I, I kind of go from there. I, I think, well, had I chosen differently, I would have only gotten the thousand, supposing I, in fact, um, got the million. Um, yeah. I just, but, I thought, um, I think that, yeah. do you, I guess it just doesn't seem to me like, I mean, I should say something about how I think about these cases, maybe, which is that I think that what's going on in, in Newcomb's case is that it can really feel like it's under your control how much money you get. Right. And I think that really that's the thing that we should care about when we're making a rational choice is not really so much like truth value of counterfactuals, because I think the truth value of counterfactuals are going to vary from context to context and the interest of the person making the claim. And I can definitely get a true reading of that counterfactual if I had chosen differently than I would have been predicted to choose differently. But the question is, at this point, when I'm making this decision, what's under my control and what's not under my control? And I think that in Newcomb's problem, it can really feel like it's under your control how much money is in the boxes. And I think that that happens because at, you know, if you find yourself reaching for just the opaque box, you generate for yourself evidence that there's a million dollars there. And if you find yourself reaching for both boxes, then you generate for yourself the evidence that there's not a million dollars in the opaque box. And so, you know, your own rational beliefs about the world will change depending upon what you do. And I think that when you're in that kind of position where, you know, you can it can be rational for you to believe that there's a million dollars there if you do one thing, and it can be rational for you to believe that there's not a million dollars there if you do the other thing. It can really deeply feel like it's under your control. And I think that the correction for that, uh, I, I think it's an illusion, and I think that the correction for that is to consider matters from this third personal perspective. And I think from that per third personal perspective, putting aside the question about how to evaluate the counterfactuals, it just doesn't look to me like it's under the person's control how much money is sitting in the boxes. The, the money was put there yesterday, uh, you know, b before the person ever even heard about this problem. It's just at this point, it's just not under their control. And I think that that's something, e even from my perspective as the decision maker, I should be capable of recognizing. I should be capable of recognizing that at this point, no matter what prediction was made, it's outside of my hands. Yeah, you, you talk about this in that paper, like, uh... There's a sort of agential illusion that, you know, we can we can control what we can rationally believe um, about the contents of the boxes, but not the contents of the boxes themselves. We can't control that. Um, yeah. And the former might give us the illusion that we also have the latter sort of control. But in fact, we don't. And, um, you know, we should take that seriously when assessing rational choice. I guess there's still a few concerns that I would have. Um, so this is something I think about sometimes is that um, when I'm making a choice, suppose I'm a determinist, right? Um, and, you know, and I think that my, my, my actions are determined in some way. Um, yeah, you know, given the prior states and, and so on. Um, but I mean, epistemically speaking, as, as far as I'm concerned, there's multiple options open to me. I might just recognize that I'm determined to produce one of them. But my being so determined isn't um, sort of really relevant to my deliberation. I'm just gonna, still going to deliberate based on the reasons I have and so forth. And from my perspective, I'm choosing, I can think about myself as choosing not just between, you know, uh, the sort of immediate outcomes, say one box or two box, or if we want to talk about newcomers, but it generalizes. But the other facts about the world which are entailed from that, that'll include things in the future and perhaps to some extent the distant future, but also about the past, right? And in a, in a sense, I'm choosing between worlds in which um, the, the causal antecedents of my action are such that they would, uh, they're determinative of choice A and the worlds in which the causal antecedents of my actions are determinative of choice B. Right, and I don't see anything wrong in principle with thinking about my choice in that way. In a way, it seems almost required. I can't think of it as like the things that are uh, correlated with or or even entailed by my choice, um, even if they're in the past, distant past, as like 
outside completely of my control, so to speak. Do you, do you understand the approach here? Does that make any sense? I definitely understand the, yeah, I definitely understand the approach. It seems, it seems bizarre to me. It's not the way that I think about what's under people's control in sort of most everyday situations. You know, I, and, and maybe the one way to think about it is that we often blame people for the, only for things that are under their control. And if you thought that, like, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire is under your control right now, then I don't see why it wouldn't make sense to blame you for the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, but that seems that seems crazy. It, it similarly, it seems crazy to me in Newcomb to blame somebody for how much money was in the boxes when it simply it simply wasn't under the control. If there was somebody watching the watching this whole thing take place um, from you know from outside the room. I, I I can't I have a hard time getting into the mindset where I would want to blame the two boxer for their box being empty. Given that they had no control. It could have been, you know, it could have been decided millennia before they were born. Um and blaming yeah. them for what's inside the one box seems tantamount to blaming somebody for the fall of the Roman Empire. Um I mean I I, I again I, I I'm sort of I'm I'm trying to say something about why I I'm attracted to to boxing. Um, I, I think I, I do think that there's a consistent evidentialist position. It's not a position that I find at all attractive, but I, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to argue out of argue you out of it. But yeah, um, no, that's fair. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, I guess so. Let's talk about control, especially when it's potentially morally loaded may not be the best terminology here, but at, at the very least, when I think about it, you know, um, sort of from my perspective as, as I'm making the choice, um, I can just reason, okay, I'm, I'm choosing between A, what are all the entailments if, if the choice A is made? I mean, on determinism, that's gonna entail things about the past. And so I can think about as I'm making the choice, you know, would I rather the world be such that the entailments of A are in place or the entailments of B are in place? And if I can read, if I'm right about what the um, entailments are, then I can be effectively deciding between different worlds or different, even, even worlds with different paths. Um, uh, it's a seems, weird kind of, it, yeah. it's a weird kind of control that it is dependent upon your ignorance. Right. I mean, yeah, you don't think that if suppose I were to show you what's inside the boxes, you would stop thinking that you have control over what was what happened, you know, at, at the moment that the prediction was made. Um, most kinds of control we have over the world don't go away when we learn more about the world. So it's yeah, I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting kind of control if it's a control that you have over the world. It's interesting in virtue of the fact that it depends upon you're not knowing something about the world. What? Well, but I, I think that's true even just in general, right? That's true even about the future as well. It's just, you know, if I learn, suppose I were to somehow know some fact about the future, then I would maybe cease to think that I have any control over that now. Um, but, you know, suppose I, I know that the um, sun is going to, um, uh, you know, run out of um, energy in 5 billion years, you know, I'm not going to think that I have control over that now. Um, but uh, can I can I ask about that? I mean, I yeah. think that I quite often know what I'm going to do in advance. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I mean, I, I know that uh, if I go to a Szechuan place, I'm ordering um, something with Szechuan peppercorn in it. Uh, but I don't feel like it's not within my control to do otherwise, even though I know. Yeah. That but I'm going to do that. Yeah, um, I guess I have to be. I mean, I, I don't want to rule out the. I know this comes up when people talk about deliberation and prediction and so forth. Um, I don't want to rule out that we can sometimes uh, be confident about our future actions, or that we can sometimes be confident that our future actions will play some causal role in some other outcome we think is like, very likely to occur. Um, but I guess the idea is that insofar as we think our, our options are open um, 
and some other future event is determined. Um, uh, it seems weird to say that our options are going to be like a particular choice we make would be um, like if I choose A, then then that would occur, and if I don't choose A, then it wouldn't occur. I can't co consistently think that I could refrain from choosing A, but the thing which is a consequence of me choosing A is determined to occur. It, I mean, maybe I didn't state that very well. Uh, I mean, I, I worry. I mean, it, it's possible that you're just. I I I took it that you were not a libertarian about free will. I mean, maybe I'm wondering whether the intuition you're having now is being driven by a kind of like libertarian thought that if I'm determined to do something, then I can't be free to do otherwise. But I, I was taking that taking it that I can be free to do otherwise, even if I know that I'm going to do something, even if I'm determined to do that thing. It can still be the case that I'm free to do otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not a libertarian. At the very least, I don't think uh, I would I would want to have, even if I were a libertarian, I would want a sort of decision theory which is consistent with the denial of libertarianism. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, although this, I hope, is another can of worms. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, yeah, I don't know how much I wanted to explore that, that specific thought, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I guess the, the worry was, I was, I was going to circle back to something. I forgot exactly what it was. Um, I gave the example with the sun. Yeah, I, I think anyways, the point I was, I think trying to get to was that, um, you know, we know more about the past and so, um, when we are sort of deliberating and even when we're deliberating about, you know, the things which are the consequences of our actions, um, we'll, we don't tend to treat the, the past as, um, open in a sense, right. In that, um, we don't, we aren't really deliberating about which sort of past we would prefer to have been the case. Um, whereas we are in, in general delivering about which future we would, would prefer to be the case. But on many views, um, the past and future are just as, as fixed as each other, um, especially if you're a determinist yeah. or eternalist about time. Or, um, it's just that they're not fixed equally in the epistemic sense. The past is much more fixed than the future. But right, right. Th that doesn't rule us out in general from... Um, I mean, if we can if we can reason about a fixed future, about what we would prefer to happen about a fixed future, why not think uh, similarly about a fixed past? Even if um, we tend not to do it as much because we know more of the past, and that sort of knowledge yeah. precludes the sort of de deliberation about it. Yeah. Now this is interesting, and maybe this connects back with the thing that you were talking about at the uh, at the beginning, because I, I do think. I think there's not just an epistemic asymmetry with respect to the future and the past. And I mean, actually, I think the extent of that epistemic asymmetry is is complicated because I think that I do know lots of stuff about the future. And there's right. lots of stuff about the past that I don't know. Um, so it's, it's not clear to me that there's a, a stark epistemic asymmetry with respect to my access, my epistemic access to the future, my epistemic access to the past. But I think in addition to whatever epistemic asymmetry there may, may be, I think that there's uh, an asymmetry uh, with respect to, with respect to causation and with respect to what I have, but I'm in a position to causally affect. I think I'm in a position to causally affect things in the future with what I do now, but I'm not in a position to causally affect things in the past. And I, I mean, I, I think that is an important part of how I think about rational action. Uh, and I, I can see that if you didn't accept that kind of non-epistemic temporal asymmetry, it would change the way you would think about rational action. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely, of course, I'm going to uh, concede that there are asymmetries, even uh, causal asymmetries between the past and the future. Um, probably others, you know, there's some more dynamic ones and other things we were talking about. Um, but the, the, the thought is that whatever those asymmetries are, they're not really uh 
really relevant to rational action. And, and the thinking was in part, um, I mean, if I, I could, I could in principle think that everything's determined and I can, um, I can deliberate between A and B and all of the entailments of, of those choices, some of which may lie in the past or even the very distant past. Um, I, I don't see how to avoid that sort of reasoning. Um, in principle. So, but do you think that it extends? So, do you think that it extends to things like blame? I mean, um, this is this is getting back to the thing that we were talking about yeah, before. I mean, yeah. it feels to me like if 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 you're going to have that kind of that kind of view where we have control over the future and the past, both, um, and I don't see why I wouldn't extend my blame to things in yeah. the past that would have been. You know, in your in your sense, interpretation of the counterfactual would have been different had I chosen otherwise. I think it does actually. Maybe this is a counterintuitive result, but yeah. I think it does in cases where, at least in cases where the person is is doing something with the intent of having made, having ensured that the past at least, not to, because made might imply something causal, having ensured yeah, that the yeah, past yeah, was yeah. a certain way. Um, so, for example, suppose someone is facing a um, a newcomb like problem. And if they're predicted to, um, if they're predicted to one box, then their predictor puts a million dollars in there, but also like murders a million children. Um, if the person knows this, right. And, and it's facing this like modified yeah. decision problem and they pick one box all the same. I think they're more in a way morally culpable for that. Um, I see. I see. <laughs> so, that, like, that seems in, right to me. I see. Um, I see. That's. I mean, maybe this is a controversial and counterintuitive. That's subject. really interesting. I'm yeah. I'm curious whether. I mean, it it seems wrong to me, but I'm curious to what extent. It seems, right or wrong to other people. I mean, I I think that. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's an interesting consequence if, um, if if that's something that the evidentialist is committed to. Yeah, if that's something I mean, that you're committed to. It's going to be. I think it would be hard to avoid, except for you know denying moral responsibility in general. Um, I think it would be hard to avoid for an evidentialist. I mean, this. I guess there's other ways to potentially avoid it, um, but. It seems to be a, a somewhat natural consequence if we think that there is moral responsibility and that you know the person is deliberating over these options about the past and i don't know it seems it seems to but i mean so somewhat naturally to me. yeah i mean yeah it, it, I, <laughs> yeah um but yeah i guess there's <laughs> it's going to be controversial and there's a lot of I don't know. I wonder if there's anything in the, in the, because uh, I'm not aware of it. If there's anything in the literature exploring some of these consequences, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm not sure. I haven't. Um, yeah, nothing. Nothing is springing to mind when I think about it. But it's. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's interesting. Um. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll I'll, I'll move on to um, other questions. Actually, there's a user, I guess I'll call him Dog. Uh, he, he was wondering if you had any views on causal powers um, or what they, whether they, they exist or what the nature of them is. There's a sort of power, causal power talk um, function in your, in your approach to causation, or, or is that sort of something else? It's, yeah, I don't think about things in terms of causal powers. I mean, I think that. I'm I'm happy to just take the laws of nature to be a kind of primitive fundamental fact about the world. I tend to have a kind of governance conception of it, um, a very non-humane understanding of laws of nature. And I think that you know causation is uh, is something something like counterfactual dependence. So uh, I I don't think of causation as being one of the kind of bottom floor ingredients of reality. I think it's a relatively high level kind of phenomenon. And I, my understanding is that a lot of the people who 
think and talk about causal powers or thinking about it much more as a kind of like, you know, electrons have a certain causal power to repel each other. And it's one of the sort of like important ground floor ingredients of, of reality. This talk, yeah, another thought I had about when we, um, you know, causation and counterfactual dependence. Um, so, you know, obviously the account has to be more um, detailed than this, but so as a, as a first pass, causation has to do something with, you know, A causing B means, or at least requires something like um, B counterfactually depends on A. Um, you know, had, had A not occurred, then B would not have occurred, and something like that. I mean, we need to add more to, to make it a plausible account. But that's, as a first pass, something like that is going to be a commitment yeah. to this kind of factual use. Um, but why? I mean, that doesn't rule out. And you already sort of granted that we don't want to rule out um, cases of backward causation, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, this might be a reason for thinking that uh, Newcomb's problem is incoherent. But it seems to me that doesn't the the prediction made counterfactually depend on the choice I make? And if so, is it the right sort of counterfactual dependence that would uh, entail that the uh, uh, my choice is causing the prediction that was made in the past? Um, uh -huh. So, so how, oh. how, can we avoid that, or what do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think it. We can avoid it. The way that I want to think about these things is that um, I want to distinguish two kinds of causal relations. Uh, and I think I, when, I, when I talk and think about this, I call one of them affecting and the other causing. Because um, I think that we, it's very natural to talk about, in English, to use the verb affect to talk about the first kind of causal relation. So I, I can say things like whether, you know, whether I take just the one box or both boxes affects what prediction was made. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, that there's there's some kind of causal influence running from the choice that I make with the box to the prediction that was made. Um, and then there's, uh, and so I think that those those kinds of facts are the ones that are going to be used to undergird causal counterfactual conditionals. And then once I have causal counterfactual conditionals, I go on to um, provide an account of singular causation where it's a relation not between things like whether I take this box or that box, but you know my taking this box caused right. this other thing. So it, you know, in the in the ideology that I like to think in terms of, I say that affecting is a relationship between variables, and causation is a relationship between variable values. So variables are things picked out by expressions like, you know, how much I weigh or you know, whether I purchase the popcorn, things like that. And variable values would be things like my purchasing of the popcorn or um, my weighing 150 pounds. And so that's to say that I, I, I think that there are versions of the case where you say that where, where you could rationally believe that whether I take just the one box or whether I take both boxes affects which prediction was made. But I don't think that it's required. I mean, I think that those kinds of cases are interesting, but I don't think they're what people are usually talking about when they talk about Newcomb's problem. Although, you know, there's some dispute about that. But that when I'm talking about Newcomb's problem, I'm taking for granted that you don't think that which box you take affects which prediction was made. And then you could ask me sort of, well, why, why shouldn't I think that the box, you know, which box you take, or sort of how many boxes you take, why shouldn't I think that how many boxes you take affects which prediction was made? And at that point, I have to give you a complicated story that involves thermodynamics and um, you know, the direction of entropy increase. But uh, right. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, it would be, I think I sort of understand where you're going there. Um, but there's, I guess, more details to, to work out. Um, I wanted to, maybe we'll come back to that, but I wanted to ask a couple other 
questions related to what others have had to say. And, and in particular, we've had a few other guests on here that have worked on decision theory. And uh, well, one of them, which is Arif Ahmed, and, and I'll have a couple of questions about him. But um, I wanted to ask a question related to something uh, Graham Priest has said, and he has um, uh, a paper where he discusses Newcomb's problem and other um, uh, mm. you know, problematic decision problems. And the conclusion he draws is essentially that rational decision um, requires of us to make inconsistent choices. You know, we're, we're, we're both obligated to take one box and to take both boxes in uh, Newcomb's problem because there are, um, uh, you know, principles of rational choice, which are both true and lead us in opposing directions. Um, it's so unlike him. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, another place where you can get a contradiction, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, I guess, I mean, to me, and uh, Arif Ahmed said something similar, that this doesn't seem to get right what we're looking for out of rational decision, um, a theory of rational choice. Um, it should, uh, if it's to be useful at all, make a unique prediction, uh, recommendation in a well-defined decision problem. And if it recommends contradictorily, then, I mean, that's not the sort of decision theory that I'm looking for. I mean, is, do you agree with that, or, or, or what do you think about um, what uh, Graham has to say in, in these cases? Yeah, I, I, you know, there are there are other cases where people have thought that it's a rational dilemma, and that no matter what you do, you're going to be failing to do something that you should have done uh, instead. Uh, so, I, so I mean, I think it's not it's not for, for Graham Priest. It's not that radical of a position, I think, to say that. Um, to say that, you know, no matter what you do, you, you're going to fail to live up to one of your obligations. I don't find that plausible. I mean, I think my view is that there's, you know, always at least one rational action. Uh, so you can never face a rational dilemma. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't feel like I have very much to say to argue somebody out of that other than that. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, I'm not even confident that it's a genuine disagreement because presume, even the people who think that there are dilemmas, so people who think there are moral dilemmas, for instance, like maybe I promise to pick you for, up from the airport. I also promise to attend my best friend's wedding uh, and I have, to, I have to break one of those promises. They say that there's, no, there's nothing that it's, that it's morally permissible for me to do in that case. They're still happy to say that it's better for me to go to my best friend's wedding than it is to pick you up from the airport. So they're still going to give you some kind of advice about what to do in those cases. They're going to describe it as, you know, the best thing for you to do, even though it's not permissible for you to do. It's the thing to do in some sense. And I'm going to say that it's a permissible action, uh, even though, you know, you've, you failed to live up to some of, you, you, you at a prior point in time failed to live up to some of your obligations. It's not obvious to me that there's a clear that there's a clear disagreement that we're having there. I mean, maybe there is, but it, it hasn't been made apparent to me that there's a disagreement. Yeah, it, seem, it seems, I think the, um, the useful analogy there to the moral case in that um, I would want out of a, like a normative ethical theory that there's no cases where all the available actions are impermissible. I mean, it seems to me that something should be impermissible um, only if there's some other action which is required or at least permissible. But I mean, what, how can it be that there's no, there's no action we can take but all the actions we can take are impermissible? Um, I don't, that seems wrong to me. I mean, maybe someone could make a consistent theory in that way. Yeah, uh, it's the kind of thing I think when I'm when I'm faced with these kinds of questions, I want to think about what else is at stake. So what kinds of evaluations? We, so like, for instance, I guess I would want to ask Graham Priest whether he would blame this person no matter what they did. Or would he think that it, the right. fact that it was an, a rational dilemma, or a moral dilemma is 
enough to excuse the person. Um, yeah, I guess I guess in, in the case if because when I think about it intuitively, if, if to say that it's impermissible um, is just the entail at least that they're blameworthy for taking that option. And if all the options are impermissible, then they're blameworthy regardless of what they do. Um, and so yeah. if you were to say that, well, no, there's some of those options which for which they're not blameworthy if they take them, maybe because they're less uh, problematic than the other ones, um, then I wouldn't call that the permiss impermissible option. That, that seems to me a permissible one, or maybe even a, a, a required one, a morally required one. Um, but, uh, yeah. but maybe he I, wants yeah. to break the connection between impermissible and blameworthy, but right. maybe, I, I mean, there, the term yeah. and, and you might want to, you might want to think about sort of whether it would be appropriate to feel, um, to feel regret about what you'd chosen, uh, in, in that case, right. in the kind of case. And I mean, I guess, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that in order to clarify for myself whether or not this was a merely verbal disagreement, I would want to think about those other kinds of normative attitudes that we have to see whether we're just agreeing about all the other normative stuff, in which case I might think we just decided to use the word permissible differently, um, or right. whether we're actually disagreeing about some of the other normative stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point because we, we may just be disagreeing on like how we're classifying, you know, the, the terms we're using to classify these sorts of actions. But yeah, what we're really committed to in the sort of large, broader context might might not be different. Um, yeah, that's that's a fair point. Um, I don't know if I wanted to ask a question about regret because that's something else that comes up in decision theory. But um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll come back to that if, if there's time. Um, I did want to ask a question about something another guest of ours has worked on. You may be familiar, maybe not. Uh, Liz Jackson has, and this is pretty unrelated to like Newcomb stuff, but it's still a decision theory. Mm. Thing. She has argued in favor of uh, theistic belief, actually, or, or at least the cultivation of um, theistic belief on decision theoretic grounds. Uh, briefly, like uh, she argues that the expected utility of theistic belief is infinite given sort of the reward of the uh, afterlife um, mm -hmm. for which which is supposed to be like infinite of infinite value to us um, and for which we have you know greater than infinitesimal credence uh, and you know we think that by believing or, or even cultivating that sort of belief we um, there's infinite expected utility of doing that. And, you know, she recognizes that there's a variety of issues that come up in decision theory if we allow for certain outcomes or, or worlds to be infinitely valued in this way, um, but is optimistic uh, that, that those can be dealt with. What do you think of this, you know, allowing these infinites or infinite uh, values of things into our uh, decision theory um, and, and how this is, and I guess more generally, what do you think of her approach here as an argument, as an argument for theism. Um, yeah, I've, I haven't read this work. I've read some of her work on belief and credence. Right. But um, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm an atheist, so I remain unpersuaded by, um, by the arguments. I mean, I haven't, I haven't read her particular version, so maybe I would find it compelling. I guess I think in general that there's tons of complicated questions having to do with how to incorporate infinities into decision theory. And I don't have any theory that I'm wedded to. I, I, I read a paper recently by um, uh, Eddie Chin and, um, oh, God, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name, but it, it's a paper called um, uh, Surreal Decision Theory, where they use yeah. sort of a field of surreal numbers um, as a way of, and you know, try to give a decision theory in terms of uh, the surreal numbers, and I, I'm kind of attracted to that that approach. But you know, I haven't I haven't really explored this stuff at all. She's, I think she's actually mentioned that approach. I don't know if she mentioned that exact paper. Um, but she mentioned that as a, approach as a potential way to deal with certain objections. You know, 
specifically objections relating to, well, what if there's multiple options, both of which have um, expected infinite expected utility in this way? It seems like we'd have no reason to prefer one over the other, um, despite yeah. there being cases where intuitively we should. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's Eddie Chin and Daniel Rubio, by the way. Um, uh, this, yes. If anyone wants to look up the paper, there's also a, a work on this by um, Kenny East Warren that I think is worth looking at, where he 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 has a paper called Decision Theory Without Representation Theorems, where um, you know he. I think it's that paper. Maybe it's a different paper. But he he talks about sort of starting with a relation of preference, and uh, it needn't it, it needn't correspond to expectations when you have infinite utilities. Hmm. Yeah. Well, but I yeah. I mean the the thing to say is that I'm just woefully uh, ignorant of all the all the various things which could be done, and I don't have a particular theory that I that I plump for. I guess uh, so. I'll mention two of the primary concerns that I had. One, one of which I um, mentioned to her, um, which is that when, if we're allowing infinities into our decision theory like this, um, we can get one of the sort of uh, problematic, I think, results is that there'll be cases where something will have an infinite expected utility. Um, and something else will have a finite expected utility. Uh, but intuitively, the latter is a much better option than the former. So like, for example, suppose we think there's this very small, but you know, non-infinitesimal chance of getting this um, uh, infinite utility, uh, sorry, this, uh, having this infinitely desired result or whatever. Um, but more likely, if we take that action, uh, say this is action A, there's a small chance it results in that and a much bigger chance that it results in some very negative, but like finitely negative result. You know, we're tortured for a million years, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And then option B, um, you know, it's a very good, but finite result, no matter what we, no matter what the world is like. So again, like, yeah, option A, some chance of getting this huge reward, but very small chance of that and a very large chance of getting a, a very negative reward but finite um, and option B is, is very good no matter what, but, but not infinite. Um, you, you calculate out the expected utilities, um, option A, um, because of the infinite, um, the, the possibility of that infinite reward is going to have infinite expected utility. Um, even though we can be pretty confident that if we take that option, we're going to, you know, be tortured for a million years, we're, we're going to get the, um, the undesired result. Uh, yeah, it's still going to come out as the recommendation of a decision theory, and intuitively, I think that's the wrong result. Um, that's interesting. So, do you think? I I think I feel like there's nothing specific to the infinity in this kind of counterexample. Like, I think it could, so long as utility is unbounded, I could cook up a similar right. kind of case where there's a very high probability of torture for a thousand years and a low uh, probability of some incredibly large but still finite uh, reward, and uh, <laughs> yeah. com compare that with an. And I think that I guess the thing I want to say about that is that um, you know if you're if you accept expected utility theory even in the finite case, and you think that I mean you don't even need unbounded utility, right? I mean it, you, you'll think that there can be yeah. cases like that where you should be willing to take quite substantial risk or quite a bad outcome in order to get yourself a tiny probability of something which is truly fantastic, you know? Uh, yeah. And I guess I, I would want to say, I would want to say that uh, you, you should be willing to take that risk. You know, if, if you're, you know, if the, if the utility of the very low probability outcome really is genuinely high enough to swamp the more probable disastrous outcome, you should be willing to take the risk. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Um, I do think that there are many cases where um, uh, there won't be, like, uh, 
how do I put this? Our preferences, there'll be cases where our preferences aren't linear. And so there's the, like, in many cases, adding more on say money or uh, yeah, yeah. something else isn't going to actually increase our, our preference of that in any right. reasonable way. And, you know, there may not be a way to increase it enough so that um, the risk is uh, worth it for us. So I, I mean, it's just going to depend on the details of the um, right. problem. I, I guess I don't, I guess I don't want to deny, um, uh, you know, the decision theory in the in the finite case. But I guess if that if that if my accepting it in the finite case is just reason to also accept it in, in the infinite case. Um, I mean, I guess so. Maybe maybe it's, maybe I could just say I can give some sort of error theory and say like I you know, the decision theory is right. The recommendation to take the um, the option which I think is more likely to be negative is rational. It's just um, some fact about my intuitions that are misleading me or something like that. But yeah, that, I don't know. I mean, that's that's the kind of position. Uh, that's the kind of position I want to take. I think that yeah, we we tend to discount low probability outcomes in our thinking, um, and that that that's a kind of irrational bias that we have. Yeah. Um... Yeah, another concern I had with respect to including these infinite values in here is that if you think about um, preferences as a sort of relative measure, right? I mean, how much you prefer, you have this sort of preference ordering of like, I prefer A to B, B to C, maybe I prefer D and E equally. And, um, and the sort of, how much you prefer one to the next. Um, I, I think having one uh, something in the um, in my preference ordering that I sort of value infinitely more than anything else. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It almost doesn't. It doesn't seem the right the right way to think about the preferences that I have. I, I mean, because um, I, I, I and in, in fact. Everything except for the the thing which is infinitely valued is like has a value of zero, and then there's the infinite value of the other thing. Um, uh, but I I don't know. You, my concern is that this doesn't really well model the way our preferences actually work. But it's not something I've I've thought very deeply about. I mean, does does that sort of concern resonate with you at all, or um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I do, I, do, I do. I mean, part of me finds it plausible to say that you can't that, that sorry, part of me finds it plausible that our preferences are going to be bounded, that there's sort of like, you know, that there's not a utility of representation of our desires where, uh, you know, things could just get ever better, 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 better. Like at some point, things are going to asymptote away. Right? And, uh, so if you if you have a right kind of cardinal representation of your utilities, it won't be the case that for any number you give me, I can find an outcome that you desire more than that number. Um, right. But uh, but at the same time, I think about, you know, it, I find it very plausible that I value each new day of life equally, and that there's not diminishing returns on days of life. Maybe there are, but I find, <laughs> that, you know, when I think about those kinds of cases, I think that like, no, it's not. It doesn't feel to me like the days get worse and worse as I get older and older. Um, and you know, if if that's true, then we can imagine situations where, like, God comes to you and says, "I'll give you a very tiny probability of in days of life in exchange for a much larger probability of a thousand years of torture." And for some in, you know, if 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 each new day of life is just as good as the one that came before it, then I think that for some in, it'll be rational for me to make that make that offer. Even if the the more likely consequence is that you know you die now, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess we might have this sort of jerk emotional response or something like that. Like, ah, uh, this yeah. there's only a small chance I'll get this, you know, ten thousand more years. 
Um, that's highly valuable to me and a much larger chance that I'll just die immediately. Um, but I mean, if you figure out how much you really value those outcomes, it may be rational for you to take it all the same. Is that that's sort of the thought? I, yeah, I definitely feel the, I definitely feel the pull of it, of thinking like you're doing something irrational if you're very likely to just die immediately after <laughs> you do that thing. I definitely feel the force of that, but I, I do think it's, I, I do think that, that that's a kind of cognitive bias where I'm just discounting the low probability of in days in heaven where it in could just be astronomically large, you know, I mean, just like unfathomably big. I think that for, for those kinds of outcomes, it's worth it to take that shot. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think I agree with that. Um, I mean, at the very, I mean, we'd have to seriously undermine, um, you know, a lot of the standard commitments that uh, are made in decision theory, both evidentialists and causalists and whatever, to mm. to avoid that conclusion. Um, all right, so I wanted to ask a question related to something that. Arif Ahmed has written on, and uh, of course, one of, one of the popular arguments that's been around for a while um, in favor of one boxing is the so-called, you know, why ain't you rich argument. That's something that mm -hmm. uh, Ahmed has has pushed, um, but there have been responses of it uh, to it. Of course, going back to at least uh, you know David Lewis has a paper on that. Uh, and people talk about. Well, you know, that he says something like, well, I, I mean, why don't I have millions? It's because there were never millions to be had. Um, yeah. I never yeah. had those opportunities. Um, uh, I mean, do you think this is a good response uh, in favor of, of uh, the causalist approach? Or, or I mean, yeah, I do. Approach? I do think that's I do think that's right. I have a I have a kind of I mean, I accept the retort that were never any millions in the room, so I don't know what you wanted me to do to get a million dollars. But um, uh, but I, I do, I mean, I have a, a paper where I think about what the, what I feel like one of the things that I'm frustrated with with causal decision theory is that you get that retort to the response, but there's not a well-worked out theory of what the connection is between rational choice and long-run riches, <laughs> or, you know, wh which kinds of, what kinds of riches you would expect to have in the long run. And so I, I have a paper where I try to work out what connection a causalist should say holds in general between the rational choice and the kind of long run riches that you end up with. And it's it's a it's a it's a view that pushes you away from orthodox causal decision theory and towards uh, a different version of causal decision theory. Um, but really roughly, what I think you should say is that um, I think that you should, when you're making a, a rational, when you're, sorry, when you're making a choice, uh, you're going to sort of at the moment of choice foresee a certain kind of long run, by which I mean, when you're making that choice, you're thinking to yourself, well, if I, if I were to make this choice over and over and over again, yeah. and circumstances were to be sort of roughly similar, uh, things would sort of work out a certain way. And I think that you should evaluate the choice that you're making in the long run by looking at the difference between what you actually get on average in the long run and what, what else you could have gotten on average in that long run. And the reason that I think in general one boxing is irrational is that in the long run that the a one boxer expects to face when they take the one box. So in other words, they think to themselves, suppose I were to face Newcomb's problem over and over again in the long run, every time taking one box, they think, well, I would expect to make uh, a million, you know, somewhere around a million dollars right, right. Uh, on average in the long run. Um, but if they were uh, on that long run that they expect to face, if they were to take two boxes instead, um, and just grant me my interpretation of this counterfactual here. <laughs> right. right. Uh, if they were to take two boxes instead, they would make a million, a thousand. And so I think for that reason, that that's a kind of bad making feature of the action. 
And it's a bad making feature that the causalist doesn't face because in the long run that the causalist expects to face taking both boxes, they think that they're making $1,000 more than on average than they would if they were to taking just one box. So, I mean, that's the general connection that I see between, uh, between rational action and expected long-term riches is that what you should want is an action which in the long run uh, would get you as much money as possible. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'll leave aside the, the you know assessment of the counterfactual. Um, I'm a little bit worried about this when we talk about the you know the long run that they expect to face, um, because in a, of course what they expect to face depends on uh, what choices they expect to make, right? Um, yeah, and um, you know, in a way, you have control over what you expect to face, um, right? I mean, if I, I can, if I plan yeah. to, you know, take both boxes every time, I can expect to face, um, you know, the, the scenario where there's a, a not a million in the opaque box every time, or most of, most of yeah. the times, whatever. And, but, you know, beforehand, I could have the alternative plan. I can expect to, um, I can plan to one box every time and, and therefore expect to face that long run where there's a million dollars in there most of the time. Um, yeah. So well, why I talk about the, you know, you expect to face, I mean, it's not really fixed in that way of what you expect to face. Yeah. Um, what do you think I about? agree that it's not, I agree that it's not fixed. Let me say something about what I think the evidentialist is going to say. Um, and you can tell me if you think differently about it, but the way that I was imagining the evidentialist would think about this is they ask themselves, they say, well, I can either take, you know, I can either take both boxes or I can take just one box. And if I take one box, then I will expect, you know, in the long run, if I were to play this game over and over again, I will expect to make a million dollars. And that's better than what I would expect to have if I were to choose just um, just the one box. So they're they're looking at the long runs they would expect to face if they were to take two, and the long runs uh, they would expect to face if they were to take one, and they're evaluating the choice on the on the basis of how good that long run looks for them. And I think I'm doing exactly the same thing, except I'm the way I'm evaluating those long runs is differently than the way that the evidentialist is evaluating them. The evidentialist is evaluating them in terms of how much money do I have on those long runs, whereas I'm evaluating them by asking how much money do I create uh, on that long run. So in other words, how much money do I earn as a consequence of my choices? So when, you know, and to think about the money that I earn as a consequence of my choice, I subtract the money that I actually got from the money that I would have gotten if I'd taken the alternative. Right. So, yeah, again, I don't want to go back to the, the counterfactual, but I don't know if it feels <laughs> like the, the evidential, evidentialist can just reason sort of um, like indicatively here, right? There's two sort of conditionals which um, both seem true, right? Um, if I one box every time, then probably I'll get about a million dollars on average. And if I two box every time, then probably... I'll get about a thousand dollars on average. Um, it seems both like both of those conditionals are just a consequence of their beliefs about the problem they face, right? And then they can predictably, right. um, um, and so I want to allow I mean, that sometimes rational, irrational choices are rewarded. Sometimes people who make the irrational choice do better than um, get get more riches than people who make the rational choice. But it seems weird to say that um, that's true, even in cases where the subject can predict that they'll um, get more riches one way rather than than another. I mean, if you if you can predict that you'll get more riches this way rather than another, then choosing the way which gets predictably um, of which you'll receive predictably fewer riches seems ir irrational. I mean, isn't that what we would want out of? Decision theory. Um, 
I think what I what I want my decision theory to do is to lead me towards actions that will make me the most money possible. And what I mean by making the most money possible is that I want it to lead me towards actions which create the most wealth. Um, and so uh, I don't want the decision theory to tell me to, you know, act in the way that I would expect to act if things were already good. I want it to lead me towards actions which will, you know, bring about the good outcomes that I want. And I, I get that that's not, I mean, I feel like uh, this is one of these, yeah. this is one of these debates where I think that there are the inveterate one boxers, the inveterate evidentialists and the inveterate causalists. And I doubt that we're going to move each other. I, I don't think that there's a hidden contradiction in evidentialism that, you know, the people who have really thought about it a lot have failed to notice. But it's just not a yeah. way that I find very natural to think at all. The way that I find it most natural to think is in terms of you know, valuing acts that create good outcomes and not valuing acts that give me evidence of good outcomes. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe there's not a ton more to say about that, at least not here. But um, I, I, I'm inclined to uh, agree with your assessment there. Um, not a, but not with the conclusions you draw, of course, but uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, it's just my, I feel that what I want out of decision theory or, or decision theory is that, you know, a, uh, it should recommend to me the, the option that uh, I can expect to um, lead to the, or lead to is not necessarily causal notion, lead to the most uh, desired result. Um, and if, I mean, we can talk about that as just, you know, um, it's going to recommend the action, which is the greatest, uh, provides me the I mean, best evidence want... for that result. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Or it um, has the greatest news value. Um, yeah. And, you know, we get in some weird cases of managing the news and, and whatever. You know. um, but, uh, I mean, that, you're going to say, well, that's not what I want out of a decision theory. I want something stronger or, or, or more about, you know, what my action is producing or causing or whatever. Um, yeah. And at that point, we're just going to, maybe we'll just say, oh, we want, we're looking for different things out of decision theory. Um, but I, I guess there's not much I can say to pump uh, or someone else's intuitions, but to say that, um, look, I'm doing better when I employ my decision theory. I'm doing like predictably, I'm getting predictably more riches when I employ my decision theory, um, then when you uh, employ yours, uh, you're predictably you're predictably getting the least amount of money that you possibly could get. Well, <laughs> um, uh, well, that's true when, when we're well <laughs> true in one sense. Um, uh, in that you know, holding fixed the amount of money that is there. Uh, yeah, I get less when I employ my decision theory um, than I could have gotten had I, you know, taken the other option that wasn't recommended by it. Um, but, um, well, here we're just going to talk about the counterfactuals again. <laughs> and I, yeah. I don't know. Um, I, but actually, speaking about uh, counterfactuals, there is an approach, I guess, is, I want to talk about just, I mean, you're critical of uh, Lewis's approach somewhat. Um, do you have a, a more general approach to to assessing counterfactuals and, and counterfactual conditionals? I mean, I, I wonder if you're familiar with um, a paper by Dorothy Edgington, where she explores this uh, so-called like a suppositional account where, you know, you assess the um, a counterfactual based on just how likely the consequent just is given the antecedent, and that's all it is um, uh, that goes into the truth of a, a given counterfactual. Um, that I, uh, so I think I've I, I think I've read work by her on. Ramsey test for indicative conditionals. I haven't seen anything 
so the, the, where the Ramsey test is that you suppose you, you hypothetically add the antecedent to your stock of beliefs and then ask yourself when you do that whether you believe the consequent. Um, I've seen her talk about that uh, for indicative conditionals, but I haven't seen anybody propose it for um, counterfactual conditionals. Yeah, it does. She does talk about counterfactuals here, and the paper's called. Actually, the paper's just it's just called counterfactuals. It's from two thousand and eight. I'm not sure if this appears in some. Um, in some collected work, I think it's just a yeah. I think it's just a paper that. Um, um, that she wrote. Yeah, she yeah. says. Uh, you no, know, I argue that the suppositional view of counterfactuals. Um, which is quite popular for indicative conditionals, extends also mm. to subjunctive or kind of factual conditionals. Mm. According to this view, conditional judgments should not be construed as factual categorical judgments, but as judgments about the consequent under the supposition of the antecedent. Uh, the yeah. strongest evidence for the view comes from focusing on the fact that conditional judgments are often uncertain and conditional uncertainty, which is a well understood notion, does not function like uncertainty about matters of fact. I argue that the evidence for this view is as strong for subjunctives as it is for indicatives. Uh -huh. Do you think? I mean, do you think? Well, I might, I might accept that. I might accept that conditional just because I, I don't think that the Ramsey test works for indicatives. But ah, okay. uh, um, I mean, it, it's an interesting proposal. I feel like the kinds of the kinds of counterexamples that I usually think about for the Ramsey test for indicatives are going to apply straightforwardly to subjunctives too. So uh, do you know this this thing, this Thomason conditional is from Rich Thomason, where he's, uh, his, his wife is Sally and he says, yeah, if, if Sally's cheating on me, I'll never, I'll never know. Because you know, Sally's, Sally's just so good at hiding things. If, if Sally's cheating on me, I'll never believe it. And that looks like it's a, a true indicative. Uh, but if I add to my stock of beliefs that Sally, or if Rich adds to his stock of beliefs that Sally's cheating on him, uh, well, then he does believe that he believes that she's cheating on him. So the Ramsey test would predict incorrectly that the conditional is false. Uh, but so in that case, I mean, why wouldn't we say that the conditional is false? Um, oh, because or, it's true, because Sally's so good at covering up her tracks that, you know, if Sally's cheating on him, he'll never believe it. Um, well, but then, and similarly, but then in, the, in the subjunctive, if Sally, if Sally were to cheat on him, uh, he wouldn't believe it. But then, uh, I mean, I guess maybe what's going on there is that there's a couple different ways we might be interpreting that indicative. Um, I mean, usually what we mean by when we say something like that, like if if Sally is cheating on him, then I'd never believe it. Um, it means something like, you know, I'd never believe it because such and so about my understanding um, of her activities or things I've learned about her or something like that. Um, but my just you know, believing it for some random other reason isn't really a counterexample to that sort of claim. But if, if the claim is that if we're making the really strong claim that if she's cheating, then for any reason whatsoever, I wouldn't believe it. Um, I mean, that could be false. Uh, I mean, if I just happen to believe it, I, I, I just don't understand. Like, it, it, that can be false no matter how good she is at hiding it. I might just come to have that belief, um, even completely independent of what she does. Uh, I mean, it. I guess suppose that Rich is um, the kind of person who doesn't, you know, doesn't get jealous, doesn't worry about these things. So if unless he were to get some indication that Sally is cheating on him, he would not form the belief that she's cheating on him. Right. And it seems right. to me that it should be true that if Sally were to cheat on him, because she's so good at you know, not giving any indication. And uh, sorry, so I'm I'm now speaking, speaking as Rich Thomason. Uh, if so, yeah. if Sally were to cheat on me, then I would not suspect a thing. That seems true. 
But then she just actually wouldn't form the belief that she cheated on him. Because, I mean... Yeah, exactly. But then, but the Ramsey test would ask me to add, it would ask the speaker, Rich Thomason, to add to his stock of beliefs that Sally is cheating on him. And then he does but He that. wouldn't do that. And then it asks him... He wouldn't him, do that, though. Well, the, the procedure, I, I mean, maybe, I'm, maybe you're thinking of a different uh, analysis, but I was thinking that the, the analysis says in order to in order to see whether that conditional is true, you add the uh, antecedent to your stock of beliefs and then check to see whether the consequent, whether you accept the consequent when you do that. Yeah, um, but I mean, I don't know. When we're stipulating this example, um, uh, you know, as, as it's been laid out, you can ask him to add that to his stock of beliefs, but he wouldn't, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I see. I mean, that, isn't that the right consequence? Well, then that's there's another problem then, which is that at that point the theory wouldn't tell us anything at all about. I mean, if the theory just says, "Look, he's not going to add this to his belief," so I can't tell you whether or not the consequent is true. Uh, sorry, I can't tell you whether or not the conditional is true. Then it's not going to predict correctly that the conditional is true. So in, in any case, it's not going to be giving us the right predictions. Well, the initial conditional about um, if she's cheating on him, or then he won't believe it or something like that, that could still be true. But this conditional yeah. about... Um, it's, it's important for the... Yeah. Uh, I mean, it works if it's in the third person. It's important that it be in the first person, right? That the speaker be... Right. Because I can add to my stock of beliefs that Sally's cheating on him, and then I will believe that he doesn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. a, it's one thing to talk about the conditional in terms of you know what the people are believing. I mean that's I mean really we're talking about conditionals about beliefs, right? A conditional, uh, right, right. You know, on the antecedent is is like X believes that P or whatever, or S believes that P, and the the consequent is you know S believes that Q. Um, yeah. But that's distinct from the original conditional of you know if S uh, if P then Q. Um. um I forgot right, exactly what right. I say about that, but, um, and I know if we, you know, David Lewis famously has other um, arguments that we, that might count against this sort of view, and I think you've uh, take something similar that um, we should think of um, conditional probabil probabilities as distinct from, in general, uh, probabilities of conditionals. Um, right. As, as that that's a that's right. Weird. You would hold as well. Uh, whether that's whether those are subjunctive or indicative, but that's they're not. Well, I think that the connection between conditional probabilities and probabilities of conditionals is monstrously complicated, uh, and I wouldn't yeah. want to say anything very firm about it. I mean, I there's it, the the literature is just enormous. I mean, there's a slew of triviality results, and then there's a slew of ever more creative attempts to patch up the thesis with uh, you know ever more elaborate machinery. And I just haven't gone through that, that literature as well as I would have to to have a, a firm position on it. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I was, yeah, I mean, I, so I, I, don't, I don't take a stance on, what, on that thesis about the connection between conditional probabilities and probabilities of, of conditionals. Yeah, that, that's fair. I mean, uh... I, of course, haven't, um, I probably explored it even less than you, but I, I'm, I'm actually somewhat optimistic that there is a way to make them, a plausible way to make the the, the thesis that they they are the same, they should be the same at least, uh, true. Um, but, uh, I mean, that may fall out of a, if we can make a, this, one of these sort of suppositional views work, that may just fall out um, automatically. Uh, but there's obviously a huge literature and a lot of problems that you have to um, contend with to make that work. Yeah, um, I mean, let me mention let me mention maybe one more worry about the Ramsey test. If you, it's difficult to make sense of the Ramsey test if it's possible to have conditionals in the antecedent. Um, yeah, because then you have to add the conditional to your stock of beliefs, and then I thought the whole, you know, whole well, I mean, it, it becomes. It, 
the probability claim sort of breaks down at that point. And but it, it seems plausible that there are cases where you can have conditionals in the antecedent. Um, for instance, I can say it's it's difficult to get conditionals like that, but I think it sounds okay to say, you know, if it would shatter if dropped, then it's fragile. Or the antecedent yeah. is it would fragile it would shatter if dropped, which is a conditional. Uh, and so so I think that's a that's another kind of concern for that um, that approach. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean we have to there's definitely stuff to work out there. And even maybe even more complicated um, conditionals you could generate even trickier cases. Um, uh, Let's see. I wanted to. I wanted to move on to slightly different questions. Still, some more decision theory stuff. Uh, we kind of touched on it briefly, but um, I was wondering what you think about, uh, you know, how to handle, or how I guess causal decision decision theorists in general should handle um, Newcomb type cases where prediction is perfect like necessarily perfect. Um, so I, I know that there's some authors that will say that this is some somehow an illegitimate problem. Um, others say that taking both boxes is, is, is still rational in this case. Um, mm. Still further, we'll say that, OK, this is a case where one boxing is rational, um, or even the CDT recommended option. Um, I was wondering what, what your approach is um uh in in this case or what you think causal decision theorists in general should uh yeah well I, i'll say what i mean i think the answer is the same to both of those what, what i say is what i think a causal decision theorist should say which is that um you know it, this was in in no matter how reliable the predictor is this is a case of decision making under certainty I'm certain that taking two boxes has more objective instrumental value than taking one. It doesn't matter how reliable the predictor is. Um, it, it, so so if, if what you mean by perfectly reliable is that the probability that the predictor gets it right, sorry, sorry, that if you mean the probability that the predictor predicted I would take two boxes conditional on my taking two boxes is 100%. If that's what you mean by the perfect predictor, then I think, yeah, you should take both boxes. You should be very sad to learn that you're taking both boxes in every version of the case, because discovering that you're taking both boxes is discovering that it was very, it's very unlikely that there's a million dollars in the opaque box. But, you know, that's the act that's going to make you the most money. And you know that no matter how reliable the predictor is. That taking two is the act that's going to make you the most money. Interesting. So, I mean, what do you think about um, there's like I know some people will look at these cases and think essentially what you have before you is a, a menu of only two options. Like, there's only two ways. Um, there's only two possible outcomes. Your predictors right. take two boxes, um, and you get a thousand dollars. Sorry. Yeah, there's only two options. You take two boxes and get thousand dollars, or you take one box and get a million dollars. You know, if you're if you're looking at that menu of options, uh, the one where you get a million dollars looks more attractive to me. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, one exactly one of those is 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 a uh, is going to uh, proceed. Why not yeah. take the one that gets a million? I think it's it's important to be clear about the sense in which it looks attractive, because I think a causalist should agree that it's attractive to take one in the following sense, that, you know, you should be very glad to learn that you've taken one, and you should be very sad to learn that you've taken two. But I think is, this is actually a kind of helpful case to focus on to bring out what I think you should be thinking about, what you should be paying attention to when you make a decision, which is uh, sort of, what will this, what will this get me if I choose this thing? Will it get me more than the alternative would? And I know that the action is going to get me more than the alternative 
sorry, I know that taking two is going to get me more than the alternative would, no matter what things are like. And when I'm choosing, what I should be doing is not, not choosing an action that I'm glad to have chosen. I should be choosing an action that brings about the most good. And so, right. uh, and I know even in the case where it's, it's perfect, the, I think even in the case where the prediction is perfect, it doesn't affect at all my belief that the action of taking both is going to make me the most money. It's going to bring about the most good. Um, so, because, I mean, I think, I think what's going on when you're thinking about it by saying, uh, by saying, you know, oh, it looks more attractive if I were, you know, it looks more attractive to take just the one box and get the million, is that you're conflating two different kinds of goods. There are the goods that the world has just provided to you and bidden. And then there are the goods that your act is in a position to influence. And I think that when you're choosing, you should only care about the goods that you're in a position to influence. And, you know, uh, so it's, it's sad news to discover that the world itself might be a bad one. It's sad to discover that, you know, the world may have provided not so much money for me. But nevertheless, this action is going to make is going to do as much as I possibly could to improve the world in which I find myself, even if the world in which I find myself is a bad one. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, so when I'm, I want to be clear about something in this, uh, the example I'm trying to set up, because um, authors will sometimes differentiate uh, uh, like an inerrant predictor and an, from an infallible predictor and uh, people use these terms in different ways. But for sake of argument, let's, uh, you know, let's take an inerrant one as one which in the actual world, you know, always makes the right prediction. And um, an infallible one is one which necessarily makes the right prediction. You know, any, any world at which it makes a prediction, um, that prediction is, is correct. Um, and so if we, if we talk about the latter, the infallible predictor, um, and, you know, we reason, uh, you know, we talk, we ask about these counterfactuals, um, you know, in those counterfactual scenarios, we can't say that this infallible predictor is predicted incorrectly because that's by stipulation is impossible. Um, so, I mean, wouldn't we assess the counterfactual, uh, as the way the evidentialist does in the other cases, like why not say, um, okay, had I, I chose, I chose two boxes, whatever. Um, normally the, the causals would say, had I chosen one box, I would have received a thousand dollars less. Um, but in this case, uh, if I say the same thing, um, I'm also committing myself to the view that, uh, predictor, which necessarily predicts correctly, predicted incorrectly. Um, that, yeah, that will tell me to some sort of contradiction. So, I, I mean, how do we, what do we, is the problem itself incoherent or are, are we, am I saying the, uh, something wrong about the assessment of the kind of factual? What, 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 do we, what do we do in this case? I mean, I'd want to hear more about how the predictor works such that it's just metaphysically impossible for, uh, for them to have made an incorrect prediction. Um, well, you know, even in, even if we're allowed to consider worlds where there's a violation of the laws of nature. I think but I can I, actually sidestep all that and just say, hmm. look, I'll, this is just a belief that the subject has. <laughs> why, why does it, why do I have to give some complete account of how it's just like metaphysically oh, okay. impossible for me to get it wrong? They just believe yeah. that it's, it's such, and shouldn't that be enough to get a decision problem off the ground? Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe the, what the, the the request was to hear more about how this person thinks about things, um, but yeah. I, I do think there are similar kinds of cases. Like, like there's the case where I think Ahmed has this decision where you are offered a bet on whether the initial conditions are such that you would take the bet and there's no violation of the laws of nature or something, something like that, where it's kind of, right, yeah. you can, you can see that there's just no, it's not exactly a Newcomb problem, but it's a case where you cannot recognize any it's metaphysical possibility in which the betting on the, past, yeah. yeah. 
But yeah, so he has the, the betting on the past case and then the betting on the laws case. And then I'm thinking about the kind of joint case where you're betting on both of them <laughs> so that it's, you know, metaphysically impossible for the past to remain the same and the laws to remain unviolated and for you to choose um, not to take this bet. And I think that in that kind of case, the, the thing I, I have to say is that the counterfactuals are not going to be well defined. So I, I can't. I mean, I, I have a story about why this is actually it's a paper that I'm working on at the moment. Um, I have a story about why those counterfactuals are going to just be undefined. Uh, and for that reason, my theory isn't going to say anything at all about what's rational to do in that case. Oh, so it's it's just sort of, I guess, neutral and or it's like, wait, wait, in, in if, the it falls, it case, falls silent. Yeah, is that because yeah. is that because the decision problem isn't a, a well defined decision problem, or like you're leaving out, or you're you're it's either inconsistent in some way, or you're leaving out um, details which are like required. For a decision problem or yeah well i wouldn't want to say that it's that these details are required for a decision problem in the same way that like you know orthodox decision theory either evidentialist or causalist is going to take for granted that you have well-defined credences and well-defined utilities yeah. and there are all kinds of you know decisions that you might face where you don't actually have well-defined probabilities or at least whatever well whatever probabilities you do have well defined are indeterminate um and you know there are other kinds of decision making rules that you might want to appeal to in those cases but you know an, an expectational decision theory isn't going to apply if you can't have a well defined expectation and i think that my decision theory isn't going to apply if i don't have well defined counterfactuals and i have i have you know reasons to think that i can't have well defined counterfactuals in those kinds of decisions yeah, I mean, I think one. That, I mean, it's just there's two things that the evidentialist would say in response is that, well, the counterfactuals that they're assessing are well defined. We're just going to look at worlds. There are worlds, like possible worlds, in which you make the other choice. Um, it's just that those worlds are going to differ with respect to the prediction that was made. Um, but here, you're, you know, we're requiring that we don't hold fixed um, something which was not. The causal consequence of your action, right? Um, we're allowing that to vary yeah. when it's in the kind of factual. Um, and, you know, you, I guess you could say, all right, I mean, it's a, at least it may appear to be a benefit of, of that approach that you can say something about these cases on which my decision theory is silent, but the cost is way too serious, right? And that you're making the wrong recommend, you get the wrong result in general. <laughs> um, I mean, is that, I, is yeah, that although, I mean, that's that's a thing one could say, I guess, I guess I get more confused about these cases because I just don't know how to think about them. It, because one of the things that I, I want to do when I think about these decisions is I know that, I mean, I think that there's a certain kind of bias that we can fall into when we're thinking about decisions like this, where we confuse our control over our epistemic state with control over the world. And I think that the way to correct for that bias is to think about things from a kind of better informed third personal point of view and ask yourself, well, what's the objective instrumental value of these actions in the various situations that I may find myself in? And in these kinds of situations, I just have a hard time thinking about what the objective instrumental value of the action actually is. And so I don't, I don't feel like I have much guidance with respect to what... I should do in these cases, because I, I don't feel like I have much guidance with respect to what would be objectively best to do. So I, I don't want to say that the evidence list right. gives the wrong recommendation in these cases. I just don't, I don't know quite what the right recommendation is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you, if your decision theory is the right one, then you would have to say that there just is no right recommendation here. Um, or at least if well, there's I, a right recommendation I, no... based on something else other than rational decision. Well, I think I would want to be more, I guess I would want to be more circumspect than that and think that my decision theory applies in certain kinds of situations and just the same way that the evidential decision theorist isn't going to apply if I don't 
have well-defined uh, conditional probabilities. Right. And, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I think that in cases where you're making decisions without those well-defined probabilities, there's no other decision heuristics you can reach for to evaluate the rationality of those actions. Um, you know, similarly, I think that my decision theory will give the correct advice about cases where I have uh, these kinds of counterfactual beliefs and um, where I have well-defined probabilities and utilities. And in other kinds of cases, uh, maybe other kinds of theories are going to be needed. In other words, I think that a, a decision theory can be correct without being complete. I think that, you know, it, to defend my decision theory, I'm defending it as correct. I'm not saying that it, it's, it, everything it tells me is true, but it may not tell me everything that there is to tell about rational action. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems, I guess that seems fair enough. Do, do you, are you optimistic that there is a sort of, um, maybe there might be some sort of general theory that's, uh, that could handle those cases as well? You know, that, that cause of decision theory isn't um, designed to handle? Yeah, uh, just to clarify, I mean, my decision theory is not causal decision theory. But, right, right. Um, I mean, I, I'm broadly speaking a kind of causalist, so I'm sticking up for the causalist here. But uh, right. I, I mean, I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting question. It would be really, I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about decision norms for cases where you don't have well-defined probabilities. Uh, it might be that the thing to say there is just that it becomes massively indeterminate what it's rational to do. I, I, I'm, in, insofar as if you have the view that when you don't have determinate probabilities, it's just massively indeterminate what your subjective probabilities are, then you might think that in these cases it's just going to be massively indeterminate what it's rational for you to do. And maybe that's just the end of the story. Uh, and there's sort of not much anything, not much more to be said about it. Or it, it might be that there's a kind of more general theory that's going to apply in cases where you don't have well-defined probabilities. And it, maybe if I had a theory like that, I would want it to recover you know, my theory in cases where you do have well-defined probabilities. Although it feels to me like it would be difficult to pull that off. But I, I wouldn't be devastated uh, if I if what I had to say about the case where you don't have well-defined probabilities was different than what I had to say, you know, it, it, in the sense of not entailing what my theory says about the case where you do have well-defined probabilities. Yeah, uh, fair enough. And, and, and another um, decision problem, you know, uh, that Ahmed has presented is one he calls the randomizing frustrator. I, I wonder if you're familiar, but in, in that there are um, two opaque boxes and an envelope. Um, you know that the envelope contains uh, $40 no matter what, and $100 was placed into one of the boxes, uh, which the, the frustrator, which is another, just another sort mm -hmm. of predictor, who is quite accurate predicted you would not choose. So it tries to put the money in the one that um, you won't choose. Um, if you if, if it predicts that you choose the envelope, then it puts it randomly in one of the other boxes. Um, uh, what, what Ahmed alleges is that, um, you know, those that prefer causal decision theory, or at least share some of the commitments that causal decision theorists have, um, will recommend taking one of the opaque boxes um, regardless, the subject's initial credence is about the location of the $100. Um, since, since the expected right. value of taking one of those boxes will be at least $50. Um, right. you know, if, if the subject thinks that the uh, that they have equal credence at the $100 as in, as in uh, the first and the second, then they'll think that the expected utility of taking either of those boxes will be 50 If their initial credence differs, then, then one of them will have, uh, uh, since the credence that it's in one of those boxes will, will add up to 100 you know, if one of them will have to be more than 50, so we'll have expected value of more than 50. Um, but the evidentialist will say, you know, the expected value of taking on, on an evidential decision theory, the expected value of taking one of the boxes is, you know, like near to zero because the predictor will, um, you know, very likely not put the $100 in the box that I choose to, to 
take and and there and the expected value of taking the envelope is a flat 40. Um, mm. so you know near zero is much lower than 40 and so I should take that. Um, do you think that uh, I, guess, I guess just straightforwardly what, what, what do you think the right answer is in this in this case? Uh, so, I mean, what my decision theory will say is it will right. say to take the envelope. Um, and so, and I do find it very counterintuitive to suggest that you should take one of the opaque boxes. And I think that that, that counterintuitiveness kinds of, kind of persists uh, reflection for me. I mean, let me, let me note something that's really weird about the way the causalist thinks about this case. So, you know, the, the version of causal decision theory that I think is the kind of best developed version is, um, you know, the version that's worth engaging with and arguing against is the deliberational causal decision theory of Brian Skirms and, and yeah. Frank Arzenius and Jim Joyce. And what, what they will say is that sort of what you, They'll say you find yourself in this position where you have, you know, three degrees of freedom. You can the three degrees of freedom are your probability that you will take the box on the left, your probability that you'll take the box on the right, and your probability that you'll take the envelope. And you could find yourself in a state where you're making any any prediction about sort of how likely you are to take the box on the left, how likely you are to take it on the right, and how likely you are to take the envelope. And what you should do is from that perspective, from that deliberative perspective where you're making predictions about what you'll do, you should calculate the utilities and then increase the probability that you'll do the action with the highest utility and decrease the probability that you'll do the actions with lower utilities. And that'll kind of take you on this deliberative trajectory where what you'll end up with is you'll end up thinking, I'm almost certain to not take the envelope and I'm split 50-50 between the two boxes. So I think I'm equally likely to take the one on the left and the one on the right. And then when I find myself in that kind of deliberative position, what these people say varies. So Brian Skirms says you should do a mixed act of taking the left one with a 50% probability and the right one with a 50% probability. Um, uh, Frank Artzenius says at that point, decision theory becomes silent. It has nothing more to say about the rationality of action. And Jim Joyce says, what you should do is at that point, you should pick one of the boxes where picking is a kind of special way of choosing that's not responsive to differences in utility. Um, but I, all of them will say that you should pick one of the, oh, sorry, sorry, let, sorry. Let me just focus on <laughs> the, the Joyce version. Joyce will say that you should pick one of the boxes. Notice what happens if you remove the right opaque box. And you now give the causalist a choice between taking just the left opaque box and the envelope. At that point, the deliberative dynamics will take you to a different equilibrium. And the equi equilibrium will be one where you think you are very likely to take the envelope and not very likely to take the opaque box. And then at that point, Skirms will say, you know, you should do a mixed act of taking the envelope with a high probability. And Joyce will say you should pick between the two. But he'll now say that it's permissible to pick the envelope, um, whereas before it was not permissible. So there's a kind of weird, a, a weird relationship between the full menu of options, including both of the boxes and the envelope, and the restricted menu of options that just has one of the boxes and the envelope. Where the causalist, this kind of deliberative causal decision theorist will say it's permissible to take uh, the envelope given the, uh, the choice between the envelope and the box, but not on the full menu. And also, I mean, in a sense, they'll, they'll end up leaning much more towards the envelope when the other box is taken away. So there's a kind of a failure of what I've called a, a Condorcet criterion. Uh, and the idea is that, well, if you, if you were to just have a one-on-one -on -one choice between the envelope and the left box, then the causalist would be leaning way more heavily towards um, taking the, the, the envelope. And if you were to get, do a one-on-one -on -one choice between the envelope and the right box, the causalist would end up leaning way more heavily 
towards the envelope. But then you sort of, so in other words, I mean, in some sense, in some very loosey-goosey sense, uh, the envelope wins in a one-on-one -on -one contest with both of the boxes individually. But if you give the causal list a choice between both of those boxes and the envelope, then the envelope just loses flat out. <laughs> it gets zero probability. There's no, you know, you're not allowed to pick it in that case. And I think there's the, there's the intuition that you should take the envelope, but I also think there's something weird about just the way that, you know, both orthodox causal decision theory and the deliberational causal decision theory treat these cases where um, changing the options on the menu makes a radical difference with respect to how they evaluate those options. And I think that the oddity of that kind of evaluation, that pattern of evaluation, is one of the things that motivated me to sort of develop a different decision theory. And, and the decision theory that I do endorse says that you should always prefer the envelope, no matter what the other, um, what the other options are. I mean, I definitely agree that that's the right result. Is that is that problem that you're pointing out? And I know you have a paper where you explore some of this. Is that is that called uh, what we say is a violation of the um, what was it the independence of irrelevant alternatives or something like that? Um, it's, um, let me think. I, is it a violation of IIA? I don't. Uh, I don't think so, because you, in the case, I mean, well, hold, so let's think about it. In the case where you just have a choice between the uh, left box left and the envelope, right. you will end up at the end of deliberation being indifferent between the right. two. Um, at least I'm going to go with the Joyce interpretation where, you know, when you're in the equilibrium liberational perspective, you're just indifferent between those two options. And then when you have the full menu of options, when you're in equilibrium, you're going to strictly prefer the left box to the envelope. So it's a, it's a violation of one principle that has been called the independence of relevant alternatives, which says that um, if you, you know, if you weakly prefer A to B, in a decision between A and B, then you should continue to weakly prefer A to B in a decision between A, B, and C. But that, right. it, it's a violation of that principle. Uh, I, I actually think that principle is false. So I, re I reject that principle, but, um, so I, I, I'm not holding it against causal decision theory that it doesn't uh, endorse that, that principle. Right, but that might be a slightly different uh, the violation of that might not be entailed by, uh, wait, 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 but you're saying that what, uh, I was thinking here's, it's, it's a, it's a, count, it's a counter example because I start off weakly preferring the envelope to the box, weakly preferring because I'm indifferent between the two of them. I weakly prefer the envelope to the box given a choice between the two, but given a choice between right. the two boxes and the envelope, I think that the left box is strictly better. I strictly prefer the left box to the envelope. Um, right. But that's, that itself doesn't entail a violation of IIA, or you don't think, and you don't think this is that, that problem itself isn't um, something to hold against. I think that there are a, a large number of principles that go by the name IIA. Uh, and there, I mean, there's at least four, um, logically independent principles that go by that name. And uh, I think it's, it's perfectly deserving of the name IIA, that principle. It's just, it's one that I reject in general. So I, I understand why somebody might want it to be true. Uh, it's a super plausible sounding principle, but I think that anyone who, anyone who two boxes is going to have to reject that principle. I think. Yeah. Uh... Do you think evidentialists are inclined to accept that sort of principle? Or, uh, or do you think it should be rejected by everyone? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess mm, that should question might be. Yeah, you might, I, you I, might think I, that I evidentialism might should be, should be uh, rejected. But. 
Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking it through on my feet here, but I, I think that I think that that will be satisfied by um, evidentialism. Well, so I mean, so I should I should back up. Sorry, I'm, I'm I think I was just running together a bunch of issues. I think that there's a kind of I think when we talk about these kinds of principles where we've got one choice with a small menu of options and another choice with a larger menu of options, I think that it's important to talk about to place constraints on the decision that you face between the smaller menu of options, uh, say, when it constitutes a kind of sub decision of the larger one. So let me, I'm, I'm now transitioning quite far away from the uh, randomizing frustrator case. But yeah. I think that uh, I think that there are some clear counterexamples to the principle that I formulated before and called the independence of relevant alternatives. If you're uh, if you're not being careful, right? So here's a kind of counterexample: is that you know I offer you you're you're at you're at your boss's house and you really want to impress your boss. And she offers you a choice between uh, beer and water. And in that kind of context, you might think, well, I'm going to go for the water because I don't want to come off like a drunkard. Um, but suppose that your boss had offered you water or beer or liquor. In that kind of case, you might think, well, <laughs> I don't want to come off as a drunkard, but I also don't want to come off as like too straight laced. So I'll go for the beer. You know, it's a kind of middle course. And you might think, well, that's a, that's a violation of the independence of relevant alternatives. Cases like this come from Amartya Sen. Uh, but you might think like, OK, so I was offered a choice between water and beer, and I preferred water. And then I was given a choice between water, beer, and liquor, and I preferred beer. But I think that's not, it's not a genuine counterexample to the principle, or at least it's not a counterexample to the most plausible version of the principle. Because I think that the most plausible version of the principle is going to say that uh, the original choice between water and beer was not I mean, the way that I the way that I put it in uh, the paper I have on this stuff is that it's not a sub decision of the larger decision between water, beer, and liquor. And so I think you have to say something really persnickety <laughs> about what it takes for one decision to be a sub decision of a larger one if these principles are going to be plausible. And uh, what I think that causalists should say, um, well, the, the persnickety principle that I think causalists should endorse, uh, uh, I, I, I actually is going to be um, um, actually is going to be violated by the uh, the orthodox causal decision theorist in the randomizing frustrator case. So sorry, I'm now back at the randomizing frustrator case. Right. Uh, so that, I mean, that was very sorry. That was a really convoluted answer. Um, uh, no, it's and, and it's, I have and I haven't sort of gone into the specifics, but you know, just hand waving over what the particulars of the criterion of a sub decision that I endorse are. I can I can just inform you. And I'll say that in this case, the decision between the left box and the envelope is a subdecision of the decision between the left box, right box, and envelope. And so I will think that uh, there's a violation of the independence of relevant alternatives that I object to by the, the causal decision theorist in this case. Uh, so, right, so when it's a sub, um, when it's a subdecision, there's a sort of IIA principle that you will that you would endorse? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right. I mean, I guess, um, do you know offhand which, which paper that is that you um, sort of work through? Oh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a draft paper called Escaping the Cycle. And it's- Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, actually, um, I was just looking at that one because that's that's one where you discuss IIA and uh, NEE and some other things. But I have yeah. a little thing. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll have to give that a look. Uh, and I, I was going to say something else quickly that, yeah, the, 
the thought that in that in that example you gave where you know you prefer water to beer but beer to water and liquor um mm. I th that definitely seems rational in some cases at least because your beliefs about what would impress the boss for example might depend on what op uh, options they offer you um you know yeah, exactly. if, if they offer you the three you might think oh they really expect me to have a alcohol and i don't know whereas if they only offer you the two then you might not have that same sort of belief and yeah. choosing differently in those cases seems might be perfectly rational um and if we have a our principle of, you know where of, of irrelevance of independent alternatives which entails that you know having a different option in uh, a preference in those cases is irrational then i mean we should i think we i, I agree that we should re reject that principle but um yeah um yeah that's all interesting i know you you know you gloss over some of the details but uh um it gets kind of complicated i imagine um i'm not sure let's see so I guess just briefly, how, I, I, I'm wondering how you would handle some of the other classic, um, you know, decision problems that come up. Um, so say, for example, the psychopath button case, um, mm. uh, where if you, you know, if you press the button, all the psychopaths get are killed and you, you would prefer that that happens. If you don't press the button, nothing happens. And but then you realize that, uh, you know, uh, likely if anyone who presses the button would be a psychopath and you don't want to die, that's the most, uh, the worst outcome of all. Um, but you, of course, you don't think that pressing the button would cause you to be a psychopath. Um, right, right. So what do, you, what do you think of, uh, what would your decision theory, or, you know, on your, on your view, what would you recommend in, in that case? Yeah, well, I, what, I, what I say to do is to not push the button. Um, I, I think that there's a sense in which what causal decision theory says about the case is exactly right. And that's, I think that everything that causal decision theory says about objective instrumental value in these kinds of cases is right. So I think that when I, you know, there are two, I, I, there are two possibilities that I recognize. It could be that, um, let's just suppose that I'm certain that only a psychopath would push this button. And I think it could be that I don't push the button and therefore I'm not a psychopath. It could be that I do push the button uh, and therefore I am a psychopath. Uh, and so therefore pushing the button would kill me along with everybody on earth who's a psychopath. And, you know, you know taking for granted all of the, um, all of the abhorrent assumptions here, by the way, I think we should not want, yeah. we should not want to right. kill psychopaths. Yeah. I, <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable discussing this case because I, I'm, very much opposed to that kind of um, that kind of attitude. But to taking on board all of those abhorrent assumptions, I think that it's true that in the world where I do not push the button, I that action um, has less instrumental value than pushing the button would in that world. In that world, were I to push the button, I wouldn't die. All the psychopaths would. And since we're stipulating that's what I want, I would get what I want in that world by pushing the button. So there's something really, you know, objectively bad about the action and the possibility where I don't push the button. There's something objectively in it. There's the other possibility where I, um, I do push the button. Uh, and in that case, in that possibility, there's something really objectively bad about pushing the button. It kills me. And that's something I don't want. So I think that when I'm deliberating about this decision, I should genuinely think to myself that you know, in both of the epistemic possibilities that I recognize, uh, I'm doing something that has negative instrumental value. And in both of those possibilities, that act is a bad one. And the, the disagreement that I have with orthodox causal decision theory is that when orthodox causal decision theory thinks about those, uh, thinks about those cases, it kind of it gets stuck in the middle. You know, I was talking about the deliberative causal decision theory earlier. And, you know, if you're, if you're confident that you're going to push the button, then 
uh, it'll say like, don't push the button, don't do that. And if you're confident you're not gonna push the button, it'll say, Why, what are you doing? Go push it. Um, and I think that that kind, of, that kind of pattern of advice seems bad to me. It seems that decision theory should be capable of just telling us something about what to do. In other words, I mean, another way of thinking about it is suppose that I think I'm very unlikely to push the button. And then at that point, causal decision theory says to me, what are you doing? You have to push the button, do it. And then I, I, be, I decide to push the button and then I become confident that I am going to push the button. And at that point, causal decision theory changes its mind and says, stop, stop, don't push the button. You're gonna kill yourself. And what seems bad about that is that when causal decision theory gave me advice advice to push the button in the first place, it knew that I was going to give myself that evidence. So it knew that, you know, I was going right. to become more, it's just completely unsurprising that I would become more confident that I'm a psychopath as I reach for the button. And so that was information that was sort of readily available to causal decision theory before it told me to push the button. So it looks like it was just failing to take that information into account before telling me what to do. And I, I guess I think that, that our decision theory shouldn't be, shouldn't change its judgment when you don't learn anything unsurprising. Sorry, sorry, when you don't learn anything surprising. Um, and it was completely unsurprising that my credence that I'm a psychopath went up. So I kind of, I want a decision theory, even though I recognize that you know, kind of no matter what I end up doing, it's going to be an action that has less instrumental value than the alternative. I want the decision theory to sort of uh, guide me toward an action in that case. And, uh, and I think it should guide me towards, towards not pushing the button. Yeah, I mean, is that is that a case, or at least are there cases where these sort of deliberative causal decision theory uh, the theories will be like unstable and and what's recommended you know as it yeah. swings one way then it's going to swing back the other way and it doesn't settle yeah. on any individual recommendation right i mean the deliberative causal decision theory was designed to deal with these kinds of cases and yeah the, and the solution for them is that you should end up in an equilibrium and an equilibrium is one where all of the all of the acts that you think you might do are assigned the same utility. So if I end up, you know, thinking I'm quite unlikely to push the button, but st I think I might still push it. You know, I think I give myself like a, you know, a one tenth probability of pushing the button and a nine tenth probability of not pushing the button. Um, when I'm in that situation. Both of the options will have the same utility, and the deliberative causal decision theorists will say. I mean, what they say varies, but Joyce will say, for instance, you should just pick one of the two. Um, either either option is permissible at that point. So you say that on your approach, uh, not pushing the button is is rational. Is that that's what you said, right? That's correct. I mean, depending on what the um, depending on what the utilities are. Yeah, yeah, but I, in like uh, I guess it was Andy Egan's paper uh, where. You're, yeah. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, as as he put it, the um, not pushing. You would recommend not pushing. But how do you get that um, when it seems like when we assess the counterfactuals, um, it's. I mean, it's just the same as some. I mean, it's, this isn't a new cone problem, but it's, it's. You get the similar result in that, like, okay, hold fixed all the. You know everything which is not a causal uh, causal consequence of my choice um had i pushed the button you know I, I still i still wouldn't have been a psychopath assuming that i'm not in fact a psychopath and i would have also gotten the desired more desired result uh, all the other uh, all the psychopaths would have died um, isn't that right isn't it the same well, that's sort one of possibility i don't know that that's true though i mean if i don't if i actually don't push the button then I accept those counterfactuals. But if I actually right. do push the button, then I don't accept those counterfactuals. If I actually do push the button, then I think pushing the button kills me and not pushing the button would save my life. Um, 
Wait, but okay. So if there you're going to say, suppose you do push the button, um, and so you are a psychopath, and all the other psychopaths die as, as well. Then you reason, had I not pushed the button, um, I still would have been a psychopath, but I wouldn't have died. And that you prefer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I still, I, it would have saved, it would have prevented me from dying if I hadn't pushed the button. <laughs> and that's better. Uh, uh, by stipulation, I'm supposed to care more about myself than, um, than right. killing all these psychopaths. Which, for some reason, you do prefer anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't know, just on the face of it, something seems in tension there. Because uh, if you do... Um, if you do push the button, sorry, if you, if you don't push the button, then you, then you should, the counterfactual seems to suggest that you should have, uh, you would have gotten more by pushing the button. Right. But if you do, if you do push the button, then the counterfactual analysis seems to suggest that you shouldn't have, because you would have gotten more right. by not pushing the button. Right. right. Uh, I mean, so that's, that's what, what I, I that's what I, when I was saying that, um, I thought that causal decision theory is correct about the claims it makes of, about instrumental value. That, that's what I meant. I mean, th th it's a bizarre situation you find yourself in, but you, there are two epistemic possibilities for you. And in both of them, you're choosing the worst option. <laughs> if, you know, uh, you, of course, you could choose a much better option, no matter what the world is like. You could choose the better option. You just know that you won't. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, I, how exactly? I mean, how is your preferred approach to decision theory delivering this result then that you should mm. not push the button? So, uh, uh, there's a the point where I part ways with. Well, oh, actually, sorry, it's not, let me not focus on that. Sorry, I was going to say something about how my view of instrumental value differs from causal decision theory, but that's not actually relevant to this case. Um, what I say is that you should sort of, you should, you know, you know that you're going to give yourself the evidence that you're making the world worse than you otherwise would, no matter what you do. If you don't push the button, you're giving yourself the evidence that you're not a psychopath and you could make the world better by pushing that button. If you uh, push the button, then you're giving yourself evidence that you are a psychopath and you could make the world better by not pushing it. And so this is a situation where I think that you're going to be giving yourself bad news about what you are doing to make the world better, no matter what. But you should try to give yourself the best news that you can. And that's, that's not, I'm not making the evidentialist claim that you should give yourself good news about what the world is like overall. Uh, I'm making the claim that you should give yourself good news about what you are doing to improve the world. And uh, it could be that, you know, you're giving yourself bad news about what you're doing to improve the world no matter what. And that's what I think is going on in the psychopath button case. But still, not all bad news is equally bad. Some bad news is better than other bad news. I think that if I don't push the button, given the utilities as Egan stipulated them, I'll think that uh, I could make things a little bit better by pushing the button. But if I find myself pushing the button, I'll think I could make things much better by not pushing the button. So in other words, the bad news that I'm giving myself about what I'm doing to improve things or to make them worse, um, that bad news is much worse if I find myself pushing the button than it is if I don't push the button. So there's a kind of an, an element of my theory which is, um, which is evidentialist insofar as I'm paying attention to the news, like what my act will tell me about the world. But I'm not, I don't care about what my act tells me about value that was already out there in the world, independent of what I, what I did. 
I only care about the news that my act is giving me about what the act is going to do to make things better or to make them worse. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think hmm, it's an interesting approach. I mean, it does seem to uh, uh, give some uh, what I would consider to be the right result in, in more cases than uh, sort of orthodox causal decision theory. Um, uh, I guess I'd have more questions on is there like a general, is there a general formula, for example, of util, uh, utility, expected utility that you would endorse or how exactly is that? Uh, is that yeah, work? there's a general theory, but the general theory is not expectational. So, right, so both orthodox causal decision theory and evidential causal decision, sorry, and, uh, and evidential decision theory say that you should try to maximize some expectation. And in the case of causal decision theory, it's a, a regular expectation of what the performance of the act would bring about. In the case of evidential decision theory, it's a conditional expectation of how good you expect the world to be additional on your performing the action. And the, I, I don't have any kind of expectation like that in my theory. And the reason has to do with the thing that I skipped over earlier about my disagreement with orthodox causal decision theory. Or I think that orthodox causal decision theory says that the instrumental value of an action is found in how good the world would be were you to choose it. And I think this is a bad measure of the instrumental value of an action. And one way of appreciating why I think this is to think about cases where I'm choosing between options which don't do anything to make the world any better or worse. So suppose that I'm at the supermarket and I'm deciding between like the left aisle and the right aisle. And they're both just as long. They have the same wait time. Um, it, it won't make any difference. I'm going to leave the supermarket at the same time. I'm going to get all the same groceries. It doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, but, you know, my life is already going pretty good, and I expect my life to continue going good after I buy the groceries. So then causal th decision theory will say that I mean, if, if you measure the instrumental value of an action in terms of how desirable it would be to perform it, then causal decision theory will say that taking the left aisle has a very high instrumental value <laughs> because things would be awesome if I were to take the left aisle. And taking the right aisle has a very high instrumental value because things would be awesome if I were to take the right aisle. Um, I think that, that that's kind of baking in stuff that's already out there in the world that I don't have any control over when I decide between the left aisle and the right one. So I think that it's a kind of flawed measure of the instrumental value of the action. I think that the right way to think about the instrumental value of an action is not by asking how awesome would things be were I to choose the left or the right aisle, but to ask how much better would things be if I were to choose the left aisle than they would be if I were to choose the right aisle. And in that case, since things are going to be just as good or bad either way, the instrumental value of the left aisle is zero. Uh, and the instrumental value of the right aisle is zero. So, um, yeah, sorry, is that? Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, I, I mean, I mean, you could continue if you want. Uh, but like, so the idea is that, I mean, instrumental value is is relative to other options, right? Um, if you think mm. about it that way. Yes, yes, uh, yes, exactly, exactly. You know, option and, A yeah. only has greater instrumental value than it has. It's not. Maybe we shouldn't think of instrumental value of an option like intrinsically it just has yeah. instrumental value when it uh, relative to some other option which is right right less likely to promote it's, the desired result or more likely. Yeah. yeah it's like it's a contrastive notion in my book so it's it's yeah it's like there's a a can be at a, at, a, at some possible world a can be um more instrumentally valuable than b uh, and it can be less instrumentally valuable than C. And I can tell you sort of how much better A would make things than B would, 
and how much better A would make things than C would, there is no just non-relative, non-contrastive answer to the question of how instrumentally valuable the act A is. And for that reason, I can't just take an expectation of the instrumental value of an action and say you should try to maximize that, because I don't think there is any such thing to be taking an expectation of. Um, nonetheless, I can take an expectation of comparative instrumental value. So I can tell you how much better I expect A to make the world than B would. And I can tell you how much better I expect B to make the world than A would. And those comparative expectations are the things that I feed into my theory. Yeah, actually, this, this reminds me of, uh, seems like, uh, this might be related to something that I was bringing up earlier and that um, like maybe it doesn't make sense to talk about how valuable or instrumentally valuable or however you want to put it, um, some option is intrinsically. Um, and maybe, uh, that maybe our preferences aren't really work. We shouldn't model our preferences that way. The, the sort of how, value, how valuable it is depends on how it, you know, how much we prefer or disprefer it to other options. So it's a sort of relative notion. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. You see like sort of the relation to what I was talking about earlier with the, um, yeah. when it came with, we were talking about the infinite utility stuff. Oh, yeah. oh, no, I don't see that. Sorry, could you say a bit more? So, um, uh, so I was thinking that um, earlier on when we were talking about I was talking about Liz Jackson's argument for um, theistic belief or cultivating theistic belief on on the basis of it having infinite expected utility or whatever. And um, one of the concerns I had was that um, well, we really shouldn't be thinking about a, a preference of ours or a, you know how much we value something as being infinite because um, uh, our preferences are really uh, a relative notion. Um, and uh, we, I mean, what it seems like one thing she, what she wants to say is like, okay, this is just infinitely valued on its own. Ignore, it doesn't matter what we think about other cases or other outcomes. This just has infinite value. Um, and, and my thought is that, no, I mean, how much thing, how much we value something, whether it be a particular outcome or whatever, um, you know, we can put a measure on it, but it's something relative to the other things that we might value. And to say that we value one infinitely is, I guess it's, you can still think of that as relative to others, but it, it makes the others essentially valued at zero. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, any yeah, other yeah, yeah. Any other differences between if, it, if, if C is valued infinitely and, and B and A are valued finitely, then right, um, right, right, right. essentially the differences in our preference there are just um, made trivial. Uh, there's no, there's no yeah. difference. Uh, and that doesn't see, model our preferences. I mean, maybe I'm, I see the, I see the connection. Of, I definitely see the connection now. I think, um, I think it's a, a, another way of making, uh, making sort of the instrumental value of an act relative, although it's not the way that it, I think I'm doing it here. And one way, one way of noticing that is just to say, point out that in a decision between two options, I think that, you know, basically the, the orthodox causal decision theorist is saying everything there is to say about uh, instrumental value. They're, they're kind of, they're getting it basically right in the case where you're choosing between two options. And, you know, in the kinds of cases that we were talking about with, um, with Jackson's uh, theory that there, you know, there were just, there's the option to either take the bet or not take the bet. And so um, I'm still going to be agreeing with the kind of expectational decision theory at that point. But then in the other cases, like uh, the lefty righty case that you talk about, or the, um, the, the, the sticker case on the presence, um, in those cases, you think the right, 
you know, the, this isn't theoretically optimal result is that you should be indifferent whether you take the left box or the right box or, or push. Oh, this your... is right. This is the, um, this is the, the cases from, uh, my paper on foreknowledge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, if there's, you know, if it was, there's two boxes lefty and righty. And if it was predicted that I would take lefty, then there's $10 in both of the boxes. And if it was predicted that I take righty, then there's nothing in either of the boxes. Uh, yeah. In that Something case, like that, yeah. I think that, I think that, uh, yeah, there's I, one thing I know for sure is that taking lefty would make the world just as good as taking righty would. No matter, no matter what. So there's, there's still, in, in that kind of case, when there's just two options, I'm going to think that if causalist is not using the right measure of instrumental value. But nevertheless, they're saying the correct thing, which is that both of those options have the same instrumental value. In my view, they both have an instrumental value of zero. Because um, neither of them is going to make anything better than the other one would. Right, right. I think, yeah. Um, I mean, at this point, so I mean, we actually, we've been going for over three hours, so we're going to, I guess we'll wrap up. Okay. But, <laughs> I, I, I hope you didn't mind uh, staying so long. It's been, it's been actually. Oh, no, no, no. Great. It's, it's awesome to talk with people about my stuff. It's, it's always a pleasure. And, and yeah. you, you were asking uh, really awesome and probing questions. So I've been having a great time. Awesome. Yeah, I guess just in summary then on that point, I guess I have to think about it some more, but I, I feel that um, your view is probably closer to mine, and which is, you know, basically just standard Jeffrey style <laughs> evidence theory. Um, yeah. And then it is to uh, then then mine is to uh, you know orthodox causal decision theory. Um, and some of those commitments and some of the points of disagreement you have with with like orthodox causal decision theory, I would. I would agree with. It seems like the major difference then is um, between us is on the sort of assessment of the counterfactuals or which counterfactuals are relevant to mm -hmm. yeah. rational choice. Yeah, and uh, and that seems yeah. But it was but it was interesting. I mean, I thought I felt like you, you were going in a way that I guess I would I, I guess I wouldn't have predicted somebody to go, which is to say that there's there's in fact not an asymmetry of control. Um, it's not just that control isn't what matters, but you were saying that, in fact, maybe I do have some kind of control over uh, which things happen uh, in the past. And that there's not, you know, similarly, I may, I may be praised in virtue of things that happened before I was born and so on and so forth. Yeah, I guess I guess that's not necessarily an entailment of, you know, evidential decision theory. And maybe, I don't know, maybe most evidentialists wouldn't endorse uh, some of the things I said there. Oh, I mean, I have no idea. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I feel like every evidentialist is a, a sort of unique little snowflake. I, I, it was, uh... <laughs> That's All right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thanks so much for 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 coming and uh, for taking all my uh, <laughs> um, uh, various questions on on these issues and for providing some of your thoughts. It's, it's actually it's been really enjoyable. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks so much for having me.